Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this April 3rd meeting of the Charlotte City Council Transportation Planning and Development Committee. Let's start, as usual, with our introductions, commencing in the far corner. Miss? Oh, sorry. Alexandria Sands Axios. Sarah Hazel, Chief Sustainability and Resiliency Officer. Jason Schneider, Communications. Good morning, Felicity, Charlotte East. Geraldine Gardner, Executive Director of the Central Line Regional Council. Marcus Jones, City Manager. Good morning, Renee Johnson, uh, committee member, District 4. Matt Funkram, committee member, District 2. Ed Driggs, committee chair. Good morning, everyone. James Mitchell, committee member at large. Ms. Babson, assistant city manager. Yolanda Jones, planning department. Allison Craig, planning. Lynn Alexander, Charlotte Transportation. David Hobbs, WBC. Steve Harrison, WFAE. Catherine Mahoney, planning. Ed McKinney, Charlotte Transportation. Kevin May, Planning Staff. Thank you. Uh, we have quite a big agenda today, and uh, I think we could end up being pressed for time, so I hope you'll all bear with me if I... Sorry, did we miss people? Online. Excuse me. Go ahead. Good morning, Dante Anderson, Vice Chair, District Jeez. 1. Wouldn't want to miss you. <laughs> Good morning, Brent Cagle, uh, Interim CEO, CATS. Others online? Renee Askew, Assistant City Manager. We good? All right. So, as I was saying, we have a, a big agenda today, and bear with me if I need to hurry us along at times just in order to make sure that we cover all of these important topics. Uh, the first item is a mobility update, and for that, I'm going to turn it over to Marcus Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, today, we want to uh, talk a little bit with you about uh, mobility. A few questions have popped up over the past several weeks, and we thought it would be good to have uh, Geraldine Gartner here from Central, Central Lina and to talk just a little bit about where we are up to this point. So last summer, uh, the council passed the uh, strategic mobility plan. So we put a, uh, I guess, a slide that has a series of plans that have been implemented or adopted by council. That strategic mobility plan really um, provided us with an opportunity to do something different than what we have done in the past. We came back to you in November and in January, uh, and I call it the Ed McKinney Show, and we talked a bit about projects that we had that aren't necessarily just transit related. And when I talk about transit related, specifically we're talking about trains and buses and maybe mobility hubs that come with those trains and buses. Um, today we want to talk a bit about a more broader discussion that goes outside of Mecklenburg County that's been going on for a long time. And that's why we have uh, Geraldine here. So as we start to talk about the st strategic mobility plan and we talk about um, streets, um, sidewalks, greenways, bike paths, uh, what have you, that's been really more or less Charlotte-centric. But there's, that goes beyond Charlotte. There's um, the transit plan the CATS has put together, as well as NCDOT's investments. And Connect Beyond, what I would consider it to be, is um, the big R 
regional plan. So what do I mean by that? I'll introduce a new concept today, big R regional and little r regional. When we think about big R regional, it is going well beyond the boundaries of Mecklenburg County. And Geraldine has done an incredible job of pulling folks together and she'll talk with you about that today. When I talk about little r regional, which I'll talk about after Geraldine shares some information, it's uh, really within Mecklenburg County. So it is the city, it's the county, the six towns, <clears throat> and there's been a lot of work in both of those areas. So with that being said, uh, I'd like to, Mr. Chair, turn it over to Geraldine. Great, thank you, okay. Mr. Manager. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the City Council. Thank you so much for having me here this morning to share a bit more about our work as a big R region uh, on Connect Beyond. We'll go to the next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so this is uh, an image that you see here of the Connect Beyond regional mobility planning area. It's two states, 12 counties, two and a half million people. Um, so we do have a vision for the region. Uh, the vision is to improve transportation choices and connections across this area, both in the short term and the long term. Uh, we've been at this work for a very long time. Uh, the origin story of Connect Beyond dates back to when the region first came together in a process called Connect Our Future to shape a vision for how we grow as a region and remain economically competitive. And we knew at that point in 2016 and 17 uh, that we had to come together as a region and improve how people get to and from work, to and from the, the job centers and destinations across our region and connect our urban, suburban, and rural communities. Um, so that was really the birth of the need to do a, a regional mobility plan and connect beyond. Uh, over two years from 2019 to when the plan was adopted in 2021, we came together. Uh, the city of Charlotte has been a, uh, a partner from the inception of the planning process, both as a funder and as a, a partner in, in the decision making and the, in the whole planning process. Um, but CATS and the MTC, the Metropolitan Transit Commission, was the sponsor, the co-sponsor, along with Central Line of this planning effort. Um, and as you'll see in a few slides, the CATS 2030 plan really becomes the DNA or the foundation of Connect Beyond. Next slide. Uh, over the course of that 24-month planning process, we arrived at what we call five mobility moves. These are the core goals of the plan. Uh, it includes everything from how we expand uh, our transit network, um, but it also thinks about how we are improving uh, the transit experience and the mobility experience for people today. Because as we work on these long-term, complex, billion dollar projects, we also have to think about how do we encourage people to have faith in the transit system and improve their mobility choices today. And that includes thinking about how do the different, the, the 17 different transit agencies that are in this planning area uh, connect both in terms of schedules and fares and lines and routes. Um, but also how we are thinking about supporting our local governments and our communities and building mobility friendly places. So thinking about transportation and land use decision making, the very uh, subject of this committee's work here in Charlotte. Um, so the multi-dimensional aspect of the plan both allows us to think in short and long term ways. And as you can see here, there are over 120 specific recommendations that we need to move the needle on over the course of this planning process uh, or, or the course of the implementation. So Connect Beyond is not just a plan. It's not just a document that's going to sit on the shelf. It is an action plan for how we come together as a region to uh, make strides and improve mobility. Next slide. So. Even though we were, had uh, big ideas about the improving the systems and, and improving how our places are ready for mobility, we also looked at how we could expand the physical network of the mobility system. Um, so you can see here, uh, this is a uh, sort of a, a drill down into the Connect Beyond system network uh, for the CRTPO planning area, that's the black boundary, 
uh, as well as Mecklenburg County. So you can see that the, the colored lines are the CATS 30, 2030 system plan. So we're really building out on that plan and thinking about how to extend those lines into our surrounding jurisdictions. One of the things that we did in the Connect Beyond process was to remain very much focused on building on local plans. So Connect Beyond not only takes the 2030 plan, but also takes plans that were done in other parts of the region and knits them together in a cohesive regional vision and action plan. So our extend, the extension of these lines, as you can see in the green, uh, various shades of green, uh, what that is really uh, saying to us as a region, not in this particular line, it is light rail or streetcar or uh, rapid, uh, bus rapid transit. We use the term uh, high capacity transit. That gives us incredible flexibility as this plan evolves over time to mean potentially com commuter rail. It could mean an autonomous shuttle at some point in the future uh, that goes to a community, picks up riders, and brings them to an employment destination. Um, so the plan has inherent flexibility, but it still maps out uh, an important vision for the future. Next slide. After the plan uh, was adopted uh, by both the Central Line and Regional Council and the MTC and our various um, metropolitan planning organizations and rural planning organizations in the fall of 2021, um, we immediately pivoted to implementation. Um, when I joined Central Line in 2019, uh, my first week on the job, my planning director said, we're doing a regional mobility plan. And as a planner, it was very exciting to me to start a job at a regional organization knowing that we had this big work ahead of us. Um, but what I said at the time, and what I said, you know, continue to say throughout the planning process and now, is that we can't just do this plan without the intention of implementing it. So this planning for implementation has been at the forefront of our work since the inception of the process. And how we maintain our momentum moving forward is one, by demonstrating meaningful progress now. Not just thinking about the you know, incredibly long-term complex elements of the plan, but thinking about how are we working with our transit agencies and planning organizations today to make meaningful improvements for the individual riders and communities that are covered in this plan. The second is to leverage the incredible amount of fun federal funding opportunities that are coming our way. By having this regional vision, we make ourselves more competitive for these federal funds. The administration has clearly signaled that they like to see that the re a region has a vision for where it wants to go and that we support individual communities pursuing their path uh, to receiving funds to implement those, those improvements locally that are in the spirit of the regional vision. And I think that's a really important point here in the city of Charlotte. We also have to address some of the sticky challenges that we still have with our existing systems. Uh, we have an incredibly complex landscape of stakeholders in our region, uh, much more complex than a lot of the major metropolitan regions that we compete against that might have one regional transit provider, one metropolitan planning organization for transportation planning decisions. So we have to lean into the complexity and make sure that we're building uh, durable relationships across the region to ensure uh, that we're talking to each other and that we're planning and implementing together. We're also facing some misconceptions about the plan. Um, there's a, a concept that it's only about transit, but we're talking about mobility. The manager talked about the mobility vision here in locally in Charlotte being multimodal. We take the same perspective and connect beyond. It's about bikes and pedestrians. It's about shared uh, 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 transportation services like our um, car uh, ride share and bike share and scooter share. It's also about commuter rail and transit. So we have to think holistically. Um, there's also a misconception that it's only about our urban centers, but one of the four goals in Connect Beyond is to connect our urban and rural communities, and that's a very important concept to thinking and acting regionally. And then lastly, that it's only a plan, that we're not really doing anything for implementation. 
Next slide. So a few things that we're doing to demonstrate meaningful progress. Um, we have many different transit providers in our region, CATS obviously being the largest, um, but we're starting a program to continue the good coordination across our transit agencies through the planning process um, to think about how do across these different transit agencies, one of the things that we did through Connect Beyond was we talked to riders across the region and you had case studies and stories of individuals who lived in Kannapolis that had to take transit to get to a medical appointment in Huntersville. It took them hours to make that ride because fares were not coordinated and schedules were not coordinated. So this is the work um, that we're hoping to do um, and are working on now in addition to improving those first and last mile connections, meaning how do you get from a bus stop to the destination that you're getting to. Next slide. The other thing that we're doing is talking as a region about how we continue to coordinate on some of the longer term, bigger picture complex issues. So that includes governance and it includes funding. So as we talk across and with our different transit agencies and MPOs and RPOs on our side of the Connect Beyond Planning Region border in North Carolina, we needed a forum to engage in these conversations and to think critically, almost like a think tank, if you will, uh, for what this means and how, how this all works together. So our role as an organization is to be a neutral platform for regional dialogue. That is why we exist. Um, so our board uh, this past uh, uh, fall set up a subcommittee called the Advancing the Plan Committee. Um, we invited elected officials, managers, and members of the business community to come together in a series of meetings to help us as staff think through these different angles uh, to advancing the work of this plan. So you can see the committee goals here uh, on the screen. One, really, that first goal is about governance and collaboration, both in the short term and the long term. What are the different models for regional governance that exist uh, across the country that might make uh, for an interesting conversation starter here in our region as we think about how to institutionalize regional collaboration? The second goal is around regional communications uh, for Connect Beyond. We know if we speak with one voice as a region, that we have a plan, that we're working together, we will be more successful with locally and also with our state and federal partners. And then the final goal is related to those, um, those partners and stakeholders in Raleigh and Washington. How can we as a region help to support local initiatives uh, as you all go seek support uh, amongst your delegation for funding initiatives here in the city of Charlotte, we want to be right with you as a region supporting you and saying your work here in Charlotte implements the region regional plan and connect beyond. Uh, the next slide shows you um, a list of our committee members. We have robust participation from across uh, Mecklenburg County in the city of Charlotte. Mayor Lyles is the co-chair. Um, the MTC had uh, uh, elected uh, two representatives, Mayor Bales and Mayor Knox, and we also have Commissioner Altman uh, on the committee as well. So I think my final slide uh, is just a, another point of emphasis that when you are successful of the, as the city of Charlotte, we are successful as a region, and we want to be able to support the work that you're doing. Uh, to continue to implement the strategic mobility plan uh, because we feel that that is really advancing our Connect Beyond vision as well. And with that, I'll turn it back to the manager. So th thank you, Geraldine. I believe over the course of the last uh, two plus years, we've had a number of conversations about this. And I think you put it together better than I've ever heard. Uh, so I I'll try to uh, build off of what uh, Geraldine uh, just said and First of all, thank you for being such a, a great partner. And I want to get back to the small R for a second, the regional approach that uh, has really been within Mecklenburg County. So the city of Charlotte, um, Mecklenburg County, as well as the six towns. <clears throat> and one thing that's been important with trying to come together 
within Mecklenburg County has been this issue of trust. If, if we go back in time, and we, 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 each time we have this discussion, we should put it out there. Um, the northern towns fully expected with the half cent sales tax that the red line would be built. It wasn't built, okay? And um, there are a bunch of complications with that. We, at some point before all of us were in these seats, maybe not you, <laughs> before all of us were in these seats, <laughs> uh, there was a, a, um, a plan to have uh, commuter rail uh, in the northern part of Mecklenburg County. We even got to a 30% design, which basically means you're ready for the federal funding. And then um, Norfolk Southern basically said, we don't want to have uh, commuter rail, um, pasture rail with, mixed with freight. So that really caused this problem where the northern towns really believed that there was something that was promised to them that wasn't delivered. So I say that to say that in the small R, building back trust is very important no matter what we do. I love the way that Geraldine set this up because what I want to do is go one level lower today and speak just about Charlotte. Okay, but I didn't want to start with that because it would appear that there is no regionalism, no discussions going on. So I really appreciate you not reading ahead. Uh, there are a couple of documents in front of you and we'll start off with the uh, identified mobility opportunities. You may recall back in uh, the fall when Ed came to you at first and presented a number of, um, how can I say it, opportunities. We said that we would come back to you in the first quarter of 2023 with actual projects. And that's the takeaway for today, okay? So instead of having you go through, two th I think Liz is 2002 um, projects in this um, document, it's just good to know that the projects are identified by district. I will tell you this, and this is, I guess, the beginning of the discussion as we move forward. If we just started to fund certain projects by district, whether it's a sidewalk project here or a lighting project there, I'm not so sure it would be helpful with us trying to address some of our congestion problems across the city. So what we're doing for the first time ever, thinking about this more broadly, and how can you have a combination of projects that could unleash additional capacity. Having said that, uh, what you have also is the blueprint for mobility investment. And I'd ask you to just turn to pages 10 and 11, because what this basically shows is all of these projects based on categories, whether it's uh, roads and complete streets, transit, pedestrian, micromobility. And what we've also done, and, and before I, I go any further, this has nothing to do with the sales tax increase. These are just the projects that we have identified, and there are some opportunities to combine these projects so that, again, we can um, create more capacity to move people and, and goods around in our community. The reason I, I brought up the sales tax, and I'm not going to bring it up anymore, is that right now you do have capacity in your CIP, you have three more bond cycles, okay? In this last bond cycle that was, was passed, uh, I think that it was $226 million of capacity. As we talk about uh, capacity, as we have talked about capacity, and we will continue even in the budget workshop this week, uh, you have about $210 million of capacity in the 2024 bond, the 2026 bond, and the 2028 bond. Okay, that's 210 each. I will tell you there are only two streets and two intersections between now and 2028 that's already planned, okay? So when you think about all of these projects that are in here, only two roads and two intersections are built into this. I'd also say to you, which I think is important, while the 2022 bond had $50 million for sidewalks, 2024, 2026, and 2028 combined only have $57 million for sidewalks. So again, if you try to, I guess force is too strong a word, but this, this is scalable, these projects, right? You could take some of the projects 
or the funding that's allocated in the, in the out year bonds and maybe replace them with this, or you think about a revenue source, whatever that is, to try to make sure that these projects are funded. Uh, I guess the last thing I would say is that, and, and I'll use District 7 because he's the chair, and so we'll go to the chairman. Each district, in, in the remaining pages, the key mobility projects in those districts are lifted up. So if I went to uh, page 24, uh, the mobility opportunities in uh, District 7, for instance, new street connections, enhance the South Charlotte Street Network by extending Bryant Farms Road to Johnson Road. New street connections provide complete streets, multimodal facilities, and help mitigate congestion on the existing system. So I, I would say that uh, this is the comprehensive list. This is our first attempt of trying to collapse some of these together to unleash capacity. And I think we would have fulfilled the request from this fall to come back to you in the first quarter. Uh, the last slide that I would uh, point you to is that on page nine, this is where we are right now. And then I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Um, these are the strategic investment areas and we're going to continue to have public engagement. We're going to continue to work on these. And ultimately, I would say, and you'll see this throughout here, there are cities that have put projects out there like Atlanta and Austin, and they have not um, done the necessary work to cost these out, and they've disappointed their um, residents because the costs weren't um, correctly analyzed. So what I would suggest to you as you look at step six, advanced planning, that has helped us even in this year's budget where we're able to come back and say we believe some projects are potentially at risk, but we have some capacity to cover those. So that is where we are. And the whole goal today from my perspective is to go to that step three to make sure that we do have some projects and oh, we do have all the projects, but we also have a path forward as to how we can give the council more information. So with that, Mr. Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, Mr. Manager, uh, I warned you that uh, we're time constrained. So we have now about eight or nine minutes for discussion of everything we just heard. Um, I would like to invite co committee members to speak and just be mindful of, of trying to give everybody a chance to say something because unfortunately we're time constrained. We will follow up at future meetings to go into these things at greater depth. The idea was just to get this information out at a high level. Um, so I will uh, throw it open. By the way, I'd like to welcome Mayor Pro Tem Winston. Good morning. Questions? Yes, sir. Just, just a comment, um, and thank you for the presentation. Um, and, and going big R first, right? Um, one of your slides says maintaining our momentum, right? I don't feel it. I don't see it, right? And so I, I just hope, uh, and, and we don't talk about it enough, right? And so, and, I, and I'm sitting here and I don't feel it, I don't see it, and I feel that somehow there's, there's a perceived or unperceived disconnect, then, then there's a disconnect, right, in terms of really the region, the big region, talking with one voice, the folks in Raleigh understanding what our goals and objectives are and how we want to get there. And so that's just my observation. Understanding I'm well versed with Connect Beyond and what it is that we're trying to do, right? I just gotta, we gotta find a way uh, to make people see, feel, uh, and acknowledge the momentum that, that you talked about. Um, I, I think that's just an observation. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell, and then Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Gardner, I think the question I have is the relationship between your organization and MTC. Can you kind of explain how you all inter, uh, interact? Yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, so we have a partnership for this work. Um, both Centralina and the MTC sponsored the Connect Beyond planning effort, and we remain in partnership through the implementation phase. But there's no formal structural relationship between the two organizations. 
Thank you. Thank Welcome. you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to piggyback off Council Member Graham's. First of all, thank you for the presentation. But you mentioned that the the uh, the building trust and the expectations of the northern towns previously. How are we nurturing that relationship, or, or how are we communicating consistently with those northern towns or their representatives to build that trust? What's the, what are the steps? I think we'll tag team. So from the little R perspective, uh, that's been the work that's been going on. Uh, so there have been um, conversations, at least between the managers, about how can we do something that's good for uh, Mecklenburg County. And one of the things I think has been lost in the discussion is that uh, there's been a lot of discussion around rail, um, but there are, and so again, when we say transit, we're really talking about the buses and rail. When we say transportation, we're talking about the projects that I'm giving you today. And so I think that's been part of it, is how can um, the different jurisdictions do what's important in their communities, as well as be a part of a broader coalition. And I don't know if Geraldine said this, and I think she would agree, I hope, is that when somebody's positioned to go, what, whatever that means and however it means, as long as it's consistent with the overall plan, we should all be supportive. Um, I'll just add with regard to all of our communities, um, we have uh, regular updates on Connect Beyond at our board meetings. Um, I think the Advancing the Plan uh, committee is to do that hard roll up your sleeves work. You have to start building trust across that committee. And so I think it's been great to have Mayor Bales and Mayor Knox being a part of that conversation, both as leaders in their communities, but also as representatives of the MTC. Um, so I think uh, you know Councilmember Graham had a great point in terms of part of our a part of our momentum is to really speak uh, in a positive and collaborative way about what the promise of Connect Beyond is. And in order to do that, we need more elected officials to come together and talk uh, together about the opportunities to collaborate on this plan and others moving forward. And. You all do incredible work in your communities. You're very busy. Um, so we're just trying to create those um, opportunities for folks to come together to build that trust because we have a lot of hard work ahead of us if we're going to make progress on some of these longer term issues. Thank Anybody you. else? So uh, <clears throat> I actually have several questions, but we are time constrained, so I'm going to cut myself off. Um, <clears throat> I did want to say, for one, Ms. Gardner, uh, the work you're doing is incredibly important. In fact, I think it's become increasingly apparent how important it is. You mentioned that uh, it's sort of helpful, or, or however you described it, for the feds to say it is essential. We have got to have a regional plan and demonstrate that we have partners and that everybody is on board. So really appreciate what you're doing. Look forward to working with you. Um, I've been in Raleigh a number of times, have talked to legislators. I think it's fair to say that there is a difference between their perception of what this plan should look like and ours, particularly as it involves rail. So maybe you could comment briefly on how we go about trying to close the gap between us and them. Because the legislature at some point is going to have to approve the referendum that we will need for revenue in order to try to pursue these goals. Councilmember, can you clarify when you say plan, which plan are you referring to? <laughs> yes, I know. Well, the point is, it, it is a one plan. It is that the, the Connect Beyond doesn't work without Charlotte. Charlotte doesn't work without Connect Beyond. And none of it works without revenue, OK? So I'm regarding this holistically. And, uh, and I'm recognizing in my conversations with legislators, again, uh, this divergence. And uh, I've tried with my own trips to Raleigh to start a better process of connecting and communicating and, and trying to achieve a convergence, I guess. But is this an issue that you've recognized or have you been able to engage on that? Yes. I mean, when, I, when we've gone to brief probably this, the same legislators, the comment I got, comment, comment I frequently get is, isn't your plan the city of Charlotte's plan? 
So I think there is a lot of confusion. That's one of the misconceptions that we have and one of the reasons why our committee is so focused on let's understand what those common communication framework points are, get those down on paper and start to use them. Because we can say very easily, let's speak with one voice, but what are the things we are speaking on? What are those points? Um, and I think we really need to work swiftly to get to that. Um, so that when you are all ready to move forward, that the region understands what are those talking points that are going to be most helpful to the work that you're trying to do moving forward. And similarly, when they, at some point in the future, might be ready to move forward with their own activities, have that same trust uh, that the city of Charlotte is going to be right next to them saying, we support the work that they want to do moving forward. I know from conversations with potential partners uh, in neighboring counties even that there is a hunger for something like this. There are local problems with transportation and the region is economically consolidated but not from a transportation standpoint. So I, I think it's really important work. The other thing, and, and the manager is going to gasp, uh, you alluded to a referendum. I don't think it's fair to tease about the referendum without acknowledging the question as to when or particularly, is it going to be this year? So right now, without a consensus having been established, I'll express the personal opinion that we're not ready yet this year. Uh, I think we owe the community a lot more in the way of a description of exactly what's going to happen and when. We're going to have to sell this. And we know from other sales tax referendums that they can fail and do. So uh, I believe, and I, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement now, uh, that to try to get this done this year would be uh, overly ambitious. I mean, there's an urge to do it because the federal money does depend on demonstrating a revenue source. So we would love to kind of get the authority for the sales tax to be able to go and apply for the federal funds. But there's no point in going out with a referendum that doesn't succeed. So. Uh, I, I think we can clarify, I believe I speak for most of us, that there will not be a referendum this year. Um, the, uh, I guess the last thing I'll mention is uh, there are big steps that I think you alluded to in terms of uh, making more specific the, uh, the investment, the cooperation, the governance of the region. Uh, I think we're going to need some sort of an authority. I think it needs to include all the stakeholders. How we go about that is what we're working on. But Mr. Graham was very right to point out that uh, we have not had sort of headline announcements or news, and there is a perception that it's not moving. And all I can say about that is this is hard work. So you, you start with a vision, and, and you think this is the thing, this is what we need, and then you get into the conversations with all of the parties, and you realize uh, that what they want, what they're prepared to invest, the terms of the governance, all of this uh, does require. It's a mammoth undertaking. We are working on it. I think we are making progress, but the headlines aren't happening as fast as maybe some people would like. So unless there's something else from the committee, I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Look forward to working with you. Okay, our second agenda item is the CATS Oversight and Remediation Report. Uh, and you all received yesterday, and we can make available for media, a memo which is basically trying to lay the groundwork for council action on some of the issues that have come to light. Uh, Mr. Cagle has COVID, and that's why he's up there on the screen and not here in the room with us. That's also why I'm going to sort of pinch hit for him on uh, talking about a lot of these issues, uh, but Mr. Cagle is here to answer questions. Um, I would like to note that uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, on the 13th of March, talked about the fact that council needs to take action, and I think we recognize that, appreciate that suggestion, so here we are. Uh, <coughs> I'll just read the first paragraph from the memo. Uh, in recent weeks, several operational and reporting failures have come to light at CATS that raise questions about the system's management and dependability. These failures are a particular concern, not only because they raise serious questions about CATS as a transportation utility, but also because they undermine public confidence in our light rail service. In response to the issues at CATS, the city ma manager issued a statement last week in advance of a media briefing hosted by him, CATS interim CEO Brent Cagle, and City Council Transportation Planning and Development Chair Ed Driggs, that's me. Uh, the memo, which is reprinted in full below, includes five strategic actions the manager proposes to take to get CATS on a stable course for the future. And Mr. Manager, I would like to invite you to summarize those for us. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. 
So uh, basically, the um, five areas that I provided <clears throat> last week started off with asking the Federal Transit Agency to conduct an off-cycle review of CATS. Typically, there's a three, every three years, the FTA uh, does a review of CATS. The last one was in 2022. Uh, Brent has had discussions with the um, regional administrator that there is an opportunity for the FTA to come back in and do a review of CATS. I think it's so important because an off-cycle review is because if you think about it, um, you have the FTA that has oversight over both NCDOT and CATS, and to come back in and do an expedited review with some key areas that were outlined in the memo to uh, include the uh, May 2022 incident as well as um, the budget, as well as maintenance, and some issues related to that. Uh, the second item, and I think that's uh, one of the reasons why I'm here today, is that I'm referring a, a heavy referral, which Liz has that she will hand out, um, to have the uh, TAP committee do a uh, comprehensive uh, overview of um, CATS so that we can have this regular cadence of discussions at this committee. And then I'm recommending also that a work group be put together that would also be able to take a deeper dive into some of the operational issues that we've had surrounding CATS. Um, the third point effective uh, immediately is just that I'm suspending the search for the CATS uh, CEO. Brent has done a, a great job. And one of the things that uh, I think is important is that there needs to be um, a stabilization, if you will, with CATS. And if there are a bunch of uh, new faces at the top level coming in and out, I think it's very difficult to uh, build the um, culture that we want to build in CATS. Also, there are some opportunities to bring in from the outside some expertise that allow us over the next six months in order to um, help stabilize CATS. And the other thing, the fourth point, which is uh, extremely important, is that we have a number of individuals in CATS that are city employees, and we have a number of individuals across the 8,000 plus uh, employees for the city that have a great level of expertise. And I'd like to uh, highlight Chad Howell, who came in from water, and in a very short period of time on loan to CATS uh, as the interim uh, CFO identified a number of budget issues that have provided us with this opportunity to, to move CATS forward. Uh, one of the issues that also popped up was asset management. I think many of you sat through the uh, budget workshop where we had David Wolf talk about the new way that the city, based on the NASA model, looks at all of our assets. And we're going to take some resources from uh, David's group and immediately place them over in CATS to help with that. And, and then lastly, I, I'm just reviewing the, the entire way that my office is structured in terms of oversight as it relates to our departments, um, specifically here at CATS. And I think that there's um, some lessons learned for me in terms of making sure that the communication channels are open and that it's not, um, that it flows up through my office as well as to the council. So, Mr. Chair, those were the, the five elements of the memo that I sent out last week. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, any questions from the committee or our guest on the manager's actions? If not, uh, let's go to the memo. The, the point of our conversation, sorry, did I miss one? Yes. Excuse me. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Can't see you back there. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I have some questions about these steps. In the March 13th meeting, I asked that this issue be referred to the, the TAP committee so that we could have regular updates. So, um, you know, I, I want to say that, but I'd also like a copy of the, the NCDOT report to be sent to the committee. Johnson, I have them here. Okay, all right. Okay, and 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 do we also have the memo that that uh, our response, the corrective action plan, well, is that in, included? In these, the exchanges that took place between NCDOT and CATS. So there may be other documents 
uh, and we certainly intend to get those and circulate them, but these okay. are the ones I have now. Well, as, I, as I've asked before, I'd like a copy of the NCDOT, the, uh, the letter of deficiency, that needs to be sent to the committee, and also a copy of the corrective action plan, and I think that we at, at the committee level should receive an update, at least monthly, um, on the status of the corrective, corrective action plan. I also want to talk about the culture of uh, CATS. Someone in CATS would have known about would have known about this. Would have known about the um, the maintenance. So I now whether or not it was communicated to the, the city manager's office, um, you know that's that that's a separate issue. But I'd like to talk about the culture with the employees. If there's an opportunity, um, like what's our what's our whistleblower policy in the city? Um, because this it's not just and, and I've heard the mayor talk about it on WFA also, the culture. We want to change the culture. We want a culture in the city where employees, um, there is a level of transparency. So I, I don't know if that's something we can, well, it is something we can talk to HR about. Um, a a whistle, whistleblower policy, what is that? Because th this culture of information not flowing to council or not being transparent or, or your office, um, that has to change, and that's what our voters and our residents expect from us, not just in CATS, in, in the zoning process, and in all of the processes. So I, I think this uncovers an opportunity for us to improve the culture and build a level of trust. When there's trust internally, you know, that's going to help externally with our residents, with the northern counties. So it, this is an opportunity for us with, on this council to, to really shift the culture, and, and this really, really highlights that. So, again, employees know, knew about this. There was possibly an employee that, you know, might have, you know, been terminated or, or I don't, someone held accountable. But th we need our um, employees to feel safe to bring these kind of issues to the forefront. So I would like to look, and this is broader than just transportation, I'd like to look at the, the whistleblower policy in the city of Charlotte um, to avoid these types of issues in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Yes, sir. sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, Brent, uh, get better. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we appreciate um, your leadership since December uh, of this year. A, a couple of comments, no questions. Um, I, and not speaking for the committee, but speaking for, for Malcolm Graham, the committee member. Um, there's a whole lot going on within CATS right now. And uh, I purposely asked that question to Brent on the 13th, what are his priorities, right, uh, as he kind of assumes this new duties and responsibility and his response was, was spot on, uh, making sure that we, we take care of the day-to-day -day operations of the organizations with all the various projects that we got on, the uh, relocation of the um, the transit center itself, the, the building of the temporary facilities, uh, the day-to-day -day operation of the bus system itself, et cetera. And so I, I acknowledge that there's a lot of work that is being done, that has to be done, uh, notwithstanding what we're talking about here today. So I'll put that in, in the most important bucket. Um, uh, but the the, the, um, the memo on CATS as related to the manager, uh, I um, I, I'm glad that um, uh, that there's some accountability for what's happening in CATS uh, occurring. Uh, it doesn't rest with another organization or agency. Uh, it doesn't rest with um, um, someone not blowing the whistle. Uh, it, it, it rests within this building. Uh, and um, uh, the accountability for operations, uh, the accountability for uh, transparency, uh, the accountability for delivering on the promise to the citizens. And so I'm glad that the manager is here. I'm glad that he will be returning often. Uh, and I'm glad that um, he has outlined uh, these various um, initiatives, um, basic operations, um, employee safety, the public safety, 
um, public trust, accountability, all is on the line from my perspective. Uh, and uh, we, we have to be uh, transparent and, and responsive to all of that. Um, I think the chairman is right. Um, we can't ask for a tax, right? If we, if we can't run the basic system of the operations, right? And so uh, I, I think we have to be realistic in terms of where we are. Um, um, I think we have to um, um, exhale, right, and, and, and not um, um, overblow what has occurred, notwithstanding the fact that what has occurred is significant, right? I think we need to keep everything uh, in perspective uh, as we move forward uh, and um, so that we're sending the right message in terms of this council this committee responses to what has occurred uh, in, a, in a manner that uh, it doesn't frighten and are, are alarm, right? Uh, uh, and notwithstanding the fact that um, there's a lot to be concerned about. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. And um, so I will be um, vigilant. Um, and I spoke at a Rotary Club, I told the manager this last week, um, on last Tuesday and took public accountability, right? This happened on, on my watch uh, in terms of some of the um, deficiencies that has occurring within the organization um, um, that we got to get right. Uh, and I, um, uh, I, I believe that we have the right gentlemen uh, and Brett helping us um, navigate this maze, uh, keeping his eye on, on what is really uh, important in terms of the day-to-day -day operation management of the, the organization moving forward, all the other projects that we have to do that are extremely important, how do we build regional support, which is extremely important, at the same time fixing what's broken. Uh, and I acknowledge um, that um, something is broken here, right? Um, something is broken that, uh, that we have to put our finger on. One question that I know we're short on time. So the, the, the federal transit um, audit, how, how is that different from an outside audit, right? What's, help me understand, and would the MTC be satisfied that this is superior to it, or do we go on a dual track? Okay, well, that, that's a tough one. I'll give it my best shot. So uh, let's start off with the MTC, and I had the question earlier today. So we will continue, Brent and his team, to provide information to the MTC based on their um, unanimous uh, request for this outside um, audit, if you will. I, I will tell you that having the, the FTA in that uh, is intimately involved with CATS and NCDOT, I think there's no learning curve there. Uh, this is something that they have suggested. I believe that we can um, put a number of items in that review that hopefully would satisfy uh, this community, that a thorough examination has occurred. And so um, I just want to be careful that I'm not suggesting that staff would stop fulfilling the request of the MTC. I believe that this review would address many of the questions that came up at the MTC. Okay, well, I, I think we want to as be in concert as much as, as we can with them. Uh, it was a unanimous vote, and even our mayor voted for it. Right, and so if this federal review is something that is a little bit superior, and they say, "Hey, we will kind of join the city to to um, get on this bandwagon," I'm all for it. But if there's any um, disagreement from their perspective that they still um, want an independent review, a majority of those members, then I think it's something that we. We, we ought to do. And uh, I don't believe we are excluding that. 
I think the idea is that we do the work we're doing and that we then take a look, talk to the MTC about whether they feel that we have been responsive before we incur hundreds of thousands of dollars of expense. And, you know, frankly, I think all of us have had mixed experience with consultants and, and things. So just want to make sure that, uh, that that is real value added and helps to build confidence before we commit to it. Public confidence and public accountability right. at now is, is on the table. So, you know, there's a burden on us here to, to make absolutely clear that no whitewash is going on, right? And, and I think that's the shared sentiment that we have here. We will do what we have to do to prove that there isn't. Uh, I had Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'd like to say that, City Manager, your points that you've highlighted, I think those are the right points to get us on the right path. Whenever we have a changing of the guard of leadership you know, at the CEO level, the CFO and operations, it's a great time to introduce new standard operating procedures as it relates to how we communicate with one another, communicate out, um, and ensure that the organization is going through this process properly. And I consider this a get fit process where we are um, investigating our financials and investigating our asset management um, practices and ensuring that we have the right foundation from a maintenance, scheduling, um, and infrastructure perspective so we can then in turn embrace the innovation and the plans that we are working on when it's the right time to do so. So I, I also agree that having Mr. Cagle continue be continuing the interim CEO um, role right now and freezing the search is the right thing to do. We need to calm down the organization um, and get a set of practices in place so that we can build on it in the future. And, Mr. Cagle has done a great job of bringing hard, hard topics to the table and employing a level of transparency that I believe is new um, for us on council. And so as we move forward, we need to set up the right cadence to Ms. Johnson's point as it relates to communication, um, both not just simply one way, but back and forth, a, a two-lane communication flow uh, between council, CATS, um, and the rest of the entities that that we serve on and help to build out our big R regional plan. So I believe this is the right, this is the right way forward. I, I, I believe we'll probably have additional bumps in the road. And just as a leadership team, we need to be prepared for that and have the fortitude to bring those hard topics um, to a level of light as Mr. Cable has done in his first few months in the interim role. So thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all I have. Uh, thank you. And Mr. Winston, I remind you, sir, that we are under a lot of time pressure. So. Yeah, I just got one, one thing to um, <laughs> say. Um, um, Mr. Graham's comments and question actually to Mr. Jones about whether um, that the, uh, the 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 uh, oversight, whether a consultant was needed or not, and whether that would uh, uh, live up to what the MTC desired, it, to me that's part of the problem. Um, and I hope this work group that we get um, that we put together will work on bridging the gap between the city council and the MTC. Um, I think that Mr. Graham even had to ask Mr. Jones that question um, illustrates where the issue lies. Um, we on the city council get held responsible, um, rightly so, as, as I said, for, for a lot of the issues that happen with cats, but we have this other board that is in charge of the policy. And those two boards, our two boards, have no official um, um, uh, table to work at together. Uh, so Mr. Jones does not necessarily answer to the MTC. Uh, so he doesn't have a, a real way of answering the question that Mr. Graham asked. Um, City Council doesn't have a presence on the MTC. 
um, and, 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 and being that we don't have that table. I think that's inherently um, at the root of this problem. We have to look at that structure and I hope this work group, that will be one of the primary um, topics to look at and find a better solution um, for how we can work together. Because this is a group that works once a month. We meet here once a month, we're dealing with that. There has to be some type of um, um, inter intersection of our work um, and, and pathways um, where we can work um, uh, between those meetings as peers in some type of official way and not just on the informal one-on-ones that we rely on right now because obviously um, it's not a sufficient way of running a transit system. I think that's at, at, at the, the core of, of the problems that we've been facing. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. I, I, I'd like to talk about that also. The MTC made specific recommendations with a unanimous vote. So while I think the, the audit from the, it's the FTC or the FTA, FTA, right? What would that, what would this report from the FTA encompass? So I think, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I, I think Brent has been trying to chime in and so, Brent, did you want to talk a little bit about the FTA review? Yeah, so I, I think that, um, so number one, the FTA would, what they've indicated is they would like to look at maintenance records, um, look at our state of good repair, the status of our state of good repair in the form of maintenance records, financial uh, documents, those kinds of things, <clears throat> because we do have an obligation as a grant recipient to maintain a state of good repair across the fleet, uh, across our system. So those are some of the things that they've already indicated they would intend to look at. I think that as Mr. Jones indicated, we would want to talk to them about um, other things as well, um, probably specific to the May 21st uh, issue uh, and, uh, and any other staffing or um, safety related issues that they deemed appropriate. But certainly they would at a minimum want to look at maintenance and uh, financial records associated with cats. Okay, so I would say that that sounds like a, a very technical audit. Um, the NTC has spoken. Um, we're not on that committee. This did happen on our watch. Um, so I, I, it happened on our watch. So I would, I would think that this is an opportunity for us to build trust with that NC, MTC, the regional partners. And, and I say that we should follow the MTC recommendations and um, have the FT, FTA review, because that is, I know that's a, um, a governing agency that, and, and the oversight's important. So I don't see where one would um, necessarily exclude the other. So that would be my recommendation that we that we do both. So uh, again, I think the, the situation right now is that we have not decided not to do what the MTC suggested. And I'd also like to mention the Charlotte mayor chairs the MTC right now. And it is not my impression that there is a majority view that we are not dealing with this properly. So I would like for us to take the actions that are contemplated in this memo and the things we've discussed, circle back with the MTC, tell us what we're doing, and if they feel that there is a need still, then we always can, can negotiate that with them. But the initial response that some of us at least have was that the manager's uh, proposed course of action uh, helps to right the ship, stabilize things, and is responsive to the concerns of the MTC. And we will find out whether we need to commit that expenditure uh, in a follow-up briefing with them at their next meeting. So I hope everybody's okay with that. I, I don't want to dive into the RFP right now uh, because we don't even know really what should be in it. Like I think we need to be, understand the situation a little better in order to describe what action an investigator would take or what sort of questions they need to answer for us. So, uh, yes. But the cost of the RFP, um, doesn't it fall under the manager's purview that he could 
Actually, uh, that, that is a misnomer. The manager does not have the authority on his own signature to commit new money on behalf of the city. The signature authority he has, maybe Mr. Marcus, would you like to comment sure. on that? But right, and so, and I guess this goes back to the Mayor Pro Tem's um, comment earlier, and, uh, and I'll choose my words carefully. I, I'm not so sure that there is structure around the MTC when it comes to a situation like what occurred a few weeks ago. Um, and that is back to the management partners report and all of the different organizations that have some oversight over um, the uh, over cats. I will say that I believe that the advice that the MTC received from one of the city staff members and legal was basically following a city council way of doing things. And I'm not 100% sure how applicable that is. But, but again, it, it, I would say that a unanimous vote as staff, we are fulfilling the requests of the MTC until they ask something different. Ms. Johnson, I, I would love to get through the memo. If you, if you don't mind, can we proceed? I, I need to talk to these, these points. Uh, your position is clear and, and noted, and we will uh, continue to think about that issue again. Nobody has said that there will not be that outside review. Uh, I'm just hopeful that we can kind of reach an alignment with the MTC and, uh, and then decide together uh, whether we think there is a need for the benefit of the public and for this group for us to get uh, outside validation. But I would like to uh, just quickly go through the points here. The, 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 the idea behind this memo is let's talk about what council should do. Let's specifically talk about our role in the events going forward. So what you have in here is a, uh, for, for uh, a level set, you have uh, an enumeration of the issues that we're aware of that have come to our attention uh, and a comment on where we are today on these different issues and then a suggestion as to next steps. And certainly a key suggestion is that we do have a working group of council members who will be on an ongoing basis, so not just a monthly meeting like ours, but on an ongoing basis will be responsible for interacting uh, with Mr. Cagle, uh, conducting interviews if necessary, or taking whatever actions seem appropriate in order to resolve what's in these memos from NCDOT SSO. Uh, and we will have on our agenda for this committee for the next few months, every time, we will have an update on CATS. Good. And uh, so that, that, that we will then, during that, w the working group will report back on what they have seen, uh, aside from any real-time disclosures. So if anything comes up that everybody needs to know, it will be made public immediately. But we will get updates from that working group, and therefore the council will be able, as a body, to weigh in on how we address these, because it's clear that uh, I think we share the feeling that somehow there's a responsibility on each of us for this. And I want everybody on council to feel involved in the steps that we take in order to fix it. So if I may, I'm just going to quickly go through this memo, talk about the issues that we know about, uh, and give you a little bit of a status. Uh, on the derailment thing, this is probably the most um, controversial, high-profile event that uh, occurred and it seemed to trigger a lot of the other disclosures. So I'd like to take a closer look at that. And again, I'll just, uh, for the record, read what is in the memo. On May 21st, 2022, one of three wheel assemblies on a Cat's Blue Line train overheated and seized up, causing the wheel to lose its natural position on the track. The train came to a stop and the passengers got off. There were no injuries and there was no recurrence of a train's failing in this manner while in service. The technical term to describe this event is derailment, which particularly in the wake of the Norfolk Southern tragedy that occurred after the CATS incident last year has led to some alarming media reports and apprehension about rail service. So where are we now? 
Katz reported the event to NCDOT State Safety Oversight, SSO, and followed all regulatory requirements in documenting and investigating the root cause of the incident. Katz also worked with Siemens, the manufacturer of the equipment, to investigate the root cause of the bearing failure, and Katz continues to monitor the axle bearings on the light rail vehicles. Katz has submitted a corrective action plan, several, to NCDOT SSO, uh, and they accepted those on March 2nd, 2023. Uh, there were some exchanges of correspondence. All of this will be made available to everybody. Uh, but we did reach a point where the NCDOT SSO had accepted the CATS uh, corrective action plan. The light ray vehicles are inspected weekly to identify any possible signs of a recurrence of the failure, and heat strips have been applied to all wheel assemblies. Until CATS and Siemens can complete necessary work on the wheel assemblies, the CATS blue line will continue to operate at a reduced maximum speed of 35 miles an hour. This operating restriction has not resulted in a reduction of the service level, and when riding from terminus to terminus of the blue line, adds between two to four minutes in trip time. So going forward, review and publish the incident reports and related documents, determine if further investigation and disclosure is needed related to the incident. So uh, I think we just need to be clear here that uh, Derailment is alarming. It's an alarming word. I believe that Mr. Cagle at one point said there was a catastrophic failure of, the, uh, of this wheel unit, which again is a technical term, meaning that the unit failed beyond kind of recovery. It, it wasn't a catastrophe. It was a, a, a catastrophic failure, meaning that unit was not, uh, was not able to be restored to service. Um, so, uh, again, I think the plan for the working group and the ongoing reporting to the city council is uh, to look at the incident reports, find out what has been done already in the course of meeting the requirements related to an incident like this, and then determine, uh, we as a group can determine uh, whether or not uh, there's uh, information that is not in those reports that we need. So that's the thought about that. Uh, the second issue is the Lynx Blue Line maintenance not timely. During the investigation of the May 21, 2022 incident, it was determined that CATS had failed to complete the 300,000 and 600,000 mile overhauls of the wheel assemblies for the uh, vehicles. This deferred maintenance was determined to be a contributing factor in the derailment. So this is a, a serious issue. CATS is working with Siemens now to accelerate the maintenance program. The first step is to request the purchase of additional dollies and to amend the current maintenance contract with Siemens to include the entire LRV fleet and the accelerated work schedule. Next steps, request for council action on April 10th to review and approve the purchase of additional six sets of dollies. And these are needed in order to speed up the delivery of the wheel sets to Siemens uh, for the maintenance that they need. In addition, on April 10th or 24th, depending on Siemens and RCA for review approval of an amendment to the current service agreement with Siemens to include all LRVs and expedite the maintenance schedule. Mr. Cagle told us about this in the meeting. Uh, there's a cost associated with it. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so we will be taking action to make sure that those things take place and that we move in a, uh, with all possible speed on the service. Uh, third issue, missed bridge and parking deck inspections. During the week of March 6th to 10th, an operations division employee disclosed to Mr. Cagle that the operations division had not completed required inspections of bridges and elevated structures associated with the blue line in 2021. Mr. Cagle reported this situation to the FTA and NCDOT SSO and instructed staff to immediately secure a bridge inspection contractor to complete the inspections. Current situation is the inspections did start on March 20th with an estimated schedule of 90 days to complete inspections for the 37 elevated structures. The inspection contractor is providing weekly reports of their findings so that CATS can take the appropriate action if needed. And again, the working group will see those weekly reports and will share any content uh, as appropriate, make them public. In the next steps, uh, CATS is sharing the weekly reports with NCD OT SSO. We'll publish the final inspection report when completed and uh, the final inspection report is estimated to be completed in the next six months. So we're acting on that one currently and immediately. Issue four, communication failures. So I think this was something that really troubled a lot of us was hearing about these things and wondering how, how it was that we didn't hear about them before. Uh, the manager has addressed this to a certain extent in point five of his plan, which is a general kind of citywide interaction with the ACMs uh, to review our communication process. Um, 
I will note, though, in the current status that the three most senior executive at CATS, those responsible for knowing and sharing what was going on within the organization, have left the employee of the city. Since taking office in December last year, CATS interim CEO Brent Cagle has been conducting extensive interviews with CATS staff to gain an understanding of the culture that led to poor performance at CATS and the lack of communication with elected officials and the public. It should be noted that these interviews and other steps Mr. Cagle has taken in the course of taking over at CATS are the reason the previously unreported issues have now come to light. I think we're on a, a good path here. Uh, I, I appreciate that Mr. Cagle brings the management expertise that he demonstrated so clearly running the airport to bear on this problem. And uh, again, this committee and council can respond to his ongoing investigation as we receive information about it. So the next steps there are formalize notification and communication procedures, promote the existing city hotline. So there is one, and we, we just need to make sure everybody knows about it and that it gets used appropriately, but that exists already. Share interview summaries with council and the public, implement the manager's strategy as he has described. Uh, NCDOT conflicts, there was evidence of disputes or of sort of uh, tension between NCDOT and CATS. Uh, one of whom in particular had a very bad relationship with uh, NCDOT, uh, have departed. CATS has stepped up engagement with NCDOT, and again, note that the corrective action plan was accepted by NCDOT on March 2nd uh, of 2023, which means that in their opinion, it's okay for us to operate the trains. They don't perceive a risk to passengers. They do require, however, because of the issue with the rolling stock, that we limit the speed of the trains to 35 miles an hour until uh, all of those, wheel until the wheel sets have been uh, repaired. Uh, so the next steps there, disclose the documents that are critical. Once again, I have these reports that I pulled uh, offline, uh, and we will make sure that they are circulated and that any communications from uh, CATS to uh, NCDOT are available to us in the public. CATS financial condition. So this is something that we need to think about. Uh, we were told that the necessary maintenance and repairs to CATS train is going to be expensive, and it's on us to pay for it, the manufacturer doesn't take any responsibility. Uh, there is also the prospect that we have to modernize the bus fleet, and we've heard about the fact that some of the buses are past their shelf life. Uh, so there is going to be a financial burden on CATS. I have a personal concern about this, but as it stands, there are no known issues. Uh, the, the debt rating at CATS remains double A, I believe, Mr. Manager. Um, and. Uh, CATS has advised us that they have sufficient capacity for the repairs and the fleet renewal. So our action on this one is to verify that condition and capacity. So those are the major issues. Uh, I did want to ask Mr. Cagle to comment on some news that he told me he had uh, since the uh, drafting of this memo. Yes, sir. So um, we, will, we will get to a place where hopefully um, I don't have to provide you with new information, but I, I guess I do need to provide you with new information and ask that uh, another item possibly be considered uh, for review of the work group. New information is simply this. Um, about, uh, about a week ago, uh, just over a week ago, our rail operations manager came to me with an issue. The issue is that due to uh, a high level of vacancies in general across, of, across our rail division, but specifically in our rail operations control center or the ROCC referred to as the Rock, um, There have been times when CATS was operating the Rock with one rail controller on duty at a time. This is not, um, this is not an ideal situation. Certainly, we would prefer to always have two rail controllers on duty at time, and the ideal situation would be two rail controllers plus a chief rail controller on duty at all times. Um, when the rail manager brought this to my attention, we started working immediately with HR um, to better compensate the controllers um, because we are going to have to move into a mandatory overtime situation with the controllers to ensure that we have two 
controllers on duty at all times. Um, we are prepared to implement that. In fact, we'll be, I'll be leaving this meeting to talk to the controllers about these specifics um, at noon today, uh, virtually again because of my situation, but do need to talk to the controllers. Um, however, on Friday night, NCDOT SSO, apparently they had received an anonymous complaint regarding this situation. Um, again, don't know from who, but anonymous complaint. So on Friday night, the NCDOT SSO sent out uh, some of their staff to do an unannounced inspection. They did find that for a period of approximately two to three hours um, in, in the morning of uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, basically 1130 p.m. to about 2 a.m., there was a situation where the Rock only had one controller uh, assigned and, uh, um, and providing service or on duty. Um, they have informed us again that, that this is an unacceptable situation. We agree and we have already provided the corrective action plan, which is um, make sure that there is a minimum of two controllers at all times in the Rock. Um, now, to do that, we're going to have to go into some overtime situations, some mandatory overtime situations, and we are going to be compensating the controllers for that. And we will be getting much more aggressive or trying to find more aggressive ways to recruit new controllers. Um, I will say the controller position is a very technical position. So we do believe that even with aggressive recruiting, we could take um, three to six months to really be able to work through the staffing issues where we have adequate staffing that would prevent us from having to use some of these uh, additional overtime measures. Um, but I, I wanted to bring that forward to you and we will be sharing um, this same information with all of city council and the MTC as well as the NCDOT uh, notice that was sent to me on Saturday um, later today with with the rest of council and the MTC. So Mr. Cagle, will you communicate with us in writing about what you just described and, and circulate the, the memo? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, then we can take uh, into consideration how we act on that going forward. Uh, I want to try and give Ms. Craig some time, and so I, I'm sorry about this. I knew we were going to be pushed, but uh, I, I think right now the real question is, uh, are people okay with this general uh, framework? Uh, are there issues that we left out? Um, we will have an opportunity tonight in our full session to talk about it some more. So um, un unless there are additions, amendments, or objections, um, yes, Mr. Mitchell, you want to speak? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be very brief because I would like to hear a report as well. But I think it would be helpful today at 5, at five or 6.30, it, issue number four. Um, I would like to see a timeline with, say, communication failures. I, I'm very troubled that it happened on May 21st, 2022. Then on March 2nd, 2023, NCDOT got an SO report, but then council was not notified to March 13th. Why was there no correspondent in 11 days? So I would like to see a timeline from you, Mr. Cago, and city manager. What took place? Uh, why wasn't there a communication to council? Because I think that's enough time to inform us before hearing about it publicly on March 13th. So can we have a timeline later on this evening? Thank you, Mr. Chair. OK. So are we good for the moment? Yes, Ms. Johnson. OK, so we just heard uh, Mr. Cago give us another update of another safety issue. This speaks to time being of the essence. This is why I, I don't think the citizens have time for the bureaucracy of a work group and then sending it to this question to the MTC if this is sufficient. I think this that confirms the need that we need a third party uh, review um, to, to take a look at all of the operations. We don't know what we don't know. So if the FTA is a technical uh, review, I, I think that's great. I think that's a great suggestion. But that objective third-party review, I think this is important.
important. I also think this speaks to um, a governance issue. So maybe there would be something to be referred to the governance committee. There's a, to, to change the culture. It's not just cats. I mean, if there were opportunities for all departments to have um, information that flows to council without us being reactive. We don't know what our OSHA reports are. We don't know other departments where there might be safety uh, deficiencies. So I just think this really opens up an opportunity for um, a, a governance structure where we are receiving reports from the manager on, on in issues of operations because we're not currently receiving that. We don't ask for that. So this is an opportunity for that, for the governance to be changed. But as far as the Transportation Committee, I think what Mr. Cagle just uh, described is another NCD report that speaks to an unacceptable practice that we don't have time for uh, work groups and um, to address. I, I think that this that, that just confirms that we need to act sooner or later than later. The MTC has made the recommendation, and I would say that we um, move forward with the MTC recommendation as well as the um, FTC or the FTA, excuse me, FTA recommendation. I think that speaks to our willingness and our goal to be transparent and um, responsive to the needs for our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Uh, your position on that is very clear. Uh, personally, I, I have the view that I've already expressed, so I, I think for the moment it'll come down at some point to a majority council uh, vote on the timing, not, not whether, but the timing of any you know, RFP action. Uh, so if it's okay with everybody, I would like to let uh, Ms. Craig speak and uh, give you the last few minutes. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and if, uh, if it's okay with you and committee, I'll just skip the presentation, just give you a, a quick verbal update. Um, so in two weeks at your zoning meeting, we will have four text amendments that will come before you for public hearing. Um, two of those are cleanup um, text amendments, and the other two have more of a policy basis. Um, one of those is to um, amend the UDO for um, where um, um, landfills are allowed. These are the land clearing and inert debris um, landfills. So we don't get very many of these, but um, it has come to our attention that, that the residents, city council and county commission would like to further limit where these are allowed in our community. So that's what that text amendment is for. The other text amendment relates to drive-throughs and multifamily in our center place types. And this really is a bridge between the zoning translation and the alignment rezoning, where we have um, parts of our city that will translate to a commercial zoning district that is in, inside of a center where we would like to have multifamily and not want to encourage drive-throughs. And so until we get to a place where we can rezone those as part of the alignment rezoning process, we will be limiting drive-throughs and allowing multifamily in our commercial zoning districts and center place types. Um, so um, I know that sounds a little confusing, but it's really, in essence, a bridge between zoning translation and an alignment rezoning process where we just, the zoning translation can't you know, do everything for us, so it's a, a gap. Um, so that will go, again, I said public hearing um, in two weeks on the 17th, and then a decision. Um, May 15th. May 15th, thank you, thank you, sir. Um, and then I wanted just to mention really briefly about the community area planning process. So we started our workshops last week, um, had one in person, I'm sorry, one online, two in person. And really I'm asking you to encourage your constituents, your colleagues, your friends, your relatives to pay attention to these and attend. Um, we're trying to get the word out in different ways. Um, and really a lot of the focus, we'll be you know, talking about what the community area planning process is, but we are also sitting down at tables with a bunch of maps and really starting to talk about what sort of refinements um, might be necessary to the policy map and guiding the residents through a series of discussions to help inform our uh, future changes to that map. So it's really important for the residents to get involved. We're starting over on the, on the west side and really just working around the clock uh, through all the different districts. And so if you could please encourage your um, your constituents to participate. If you have any questions, please um, feel free to reach out to me or to Alicia Osborne, who is the area planning um, project manager, and we'd be happy to um, answer any questions that you may have. So, so uh, 
Yes, sir. Go ahead. Graham yeah. was first. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. We, we had two last week, and they weren't very well attended. And so we just need the luxury of of a, a runway um, so we can inform neighborhood associations and, and neighborhood leaders, et cetera. And so uh, we just need more. I only found about it the, the week before. Right. So. You know. So and, and I believe you were provided in the council packet some um, things that you can just send out. But, but I'm talking to Jason about other ways that we can get more information out to the community. What sort of communication ideas that he has, and so he has some things that we're going to be working on this week. Okay. But yes, um, we'll make sure that we'll that you have what you need to be to be able to send out information to. Yeah, just in the right way. You yeah. know yeah. where, when, and you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Mr. Mitchell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To follow up, Councilman Graham, I think we got three that's going to occur in April before we meet again on May 1st. So to Councilman Graham, somehow if just highlight those three and put those sure. in front of us. I think it would be helpful. But second, kudos to the planning staff. Uh, uh, Committee, I would tell you item number nine, line, uh, land clearing and debris has been a big issue that Councilman Graham, Councilman Johnson, and Councilman Mayfield uh, there's a proposal for one in Oakdale. I brought it to staff. I have to give Solomon Fortune and, um, oh gosh, oh, she's going to kill me. Shannon. Shannon Fry. Shannon Fry. Oh, and Nan Peterson. Thank you. <laughs> and Nan talking. Peterson, yeah. a lot of help. We went to a community meeting. So thank you so much for responding to an important need in our community that needs to be addressed. And I see we're going to create a new category called M ML-2. For land debris, okay. So that so it, they will only be allowed in that district and under prescribed conditions under conditional zoning. And in a condition rezoning, so they yes. will have to file rezoning to get the public involved. Correct. Because this one has been a nightmare for the citizens I attend Oakdale. Yeah, so thank you, staff. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. If there's nobody else, uh, Ms. Craig, uh, these topics are very important. We'll try to make sure to uh, have a larger segment available for you to provide an update. But I think the key question now is, uh, does this committee have any comments or, or can we just, it's informational basically at this point, right? So today, do you need a vote we'll, from us? We'll go to or? public hearing um, yes. in two weeks. So I, I guess all we need is a nod to be able to say tonight to the full council that we are supportive of these changes. Is that okay? All right. Great, thank you. And Look at that, 11.32. You're the man. Whew. You're the man. <laughs> uh, anything else for the committee? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, make a motion to adjourn. All right. All in favor, get up and leave. <laughs>
Dimple Ashmira, committee chair. Welcome back, Mom. Uh, glad to have you back, Jane Smith, your vice chair. Congratulations on your newest addition, Lawana Mayfield, committee member. Congratulations, chair person. Um, this is Dante Anderson, district one community member. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce uh, staff could you please introduce yourselves good afternoon everyone i am sheila simpson from the human resources department good afternoon uh, ryan bergman budget director congrats ms ashmira braxton winston mayor pro tem marie harris strategy and budget jaleo strategy and budget Renee Askew, City Manager's Office. It okay, looks like we have everyone. Uh, did I miss anyone? Okay, looks like we're ready to get started here. <laughs> we have two important topics. Is your voice? So, oh, yeah, Michael. My mic's can up. You, can you all hear me? Madam, <clears throat> Madam Chair? Yes. We do have about six guests uh, here in the room as well. Would you like them to introduce themselves? Yes, please. Uh, Caleb Sedros from Charlotte Equitable Development Commission. Congratulations, Dimple. It's Carolyn Millen, member of Equ Equitable Development Commission. Matt Hassett, City Treasurer, Finance. Cherry Smith, Strategy and Budget. And we have our interns. Go right ahead. Claire McGee, legal intern. Austin Panamino, intern for the city attorney's office. Mason Butner, also a extern with the city attorney's office. I think we're ready, Madam Chair. All right, we got a whole village here, so that's great. <clears throat> I had talked to Mr. Bergman and Mr. Vice Chair before the meeting, so what we're going to do, we are going to go through items that are time sensitive. Uh, so first, we'll go ahead with our budget workshop review because we do have budget workshop coming up on April 6th. So, Mr. Bergman, if you want to go ahead and walk us through a budget workshop overview. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so we do have a workshop on Thursday uh, starting at 1.30. We did add a little bit more time uh, to get through one more item that we weren't able to get through last month. So you can see on the updated schedule here, um, we've been able to get through everything with the exception of the water and stormwater budget outlook from March 9th. So we will add that to this workshop and you can see the, uh, the schedule, pretty heavy schedule with revaluation, uh, revaluation impacts and staying in place strategies and then all of our enterprise funds will come and present their budget outlook. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, similar to what we did the last couple of workshops uh, in the committee prior, I'll talk a little bit about each presentation, just one slide per presentation to talk about what we're trying to get out of it and the discussion that will be had. Uh, the first presentation, uh, the county assessor, Ken Joyner, will come in. Uh, he'll talk about the citywide results. He'll talk about the actual process, some of the citywide impacts. Uh, deadlines and uh, give him an give council an opportunity to ask questions of him. Uh, if we go to the next slide, after that is when we'll talk about um, some of the impacts and, and where it starts to impact Charlotte residents. Uh, as a reminder, revaluation is something the state requires that the county conducts that the city really doesn't have a whole lot to do with. Um, but it does, of course, impact tax bills for residents. So revaluation on its own gives no more revenue to the city of Charlotte uh, if uh, done at a revenue neutral tax rate. So what we're going to talk about is uh, we'll kind of explain how a revenue neutral tax rate is, is uh, uh, figured out, talk about the impacts. We will provide maps for each of you 
in your packet on some of the district by district impacts uh, from some of the assessed value. And then we'll get in, we'll have uh, Sean Heath from housing uh, and Andrew Bowen from uh, IT come in to talk a little bit about the anti-displacement programs, uh, overview of tax relief programs, and then also some of the data we have to try to answer some of your guys' questions. Uh, if we go to the next one, then we will bring in uh, CATS to talk about their budget outlook. Um, I, I know that the Transportation Committee talked a little bit about CATS this morning. Uh, the, the budget uh, process for CATS is a little bit different because of the MTC. So some of this information has already been presented to the MTC, uh, but uh, similar to past years, we do run everything through our budget workshop process as well. So. Uh, CATS will uh, come in and talk about their investments, uh, some of the things that they feel they need to emphasize, and the financial outlook for FY24. Uh, they, they, they have already indicated that no fair increase is planned. Okay. And then uh, Water and Stormwater will come in and talk about uh, the outlook for them. Both Water and Stormwater are uh, extremely dependent on capital projects. Uh, that's uh, by far the biggest part of their budget to the tune of more than two thirds of their budget. Um, so some of the stresses on capital projects uh, and inflation and project inflation are certainly impacting Charlotte Water and Charlotte Stormwater and uh, Angela Charles and Mike Davis will be on hand to talk about those. And then finally, uh, we will, uh, if we go to the next slide, Haley Gentry will be here to talk about aviation and their budget outlook. Um, there is a lot going on at the airport, uh, some uh, uh, pretty heavy growth out there, and, and they'll talk about their five-year CIP plan and then some of the things that they've shared in the past, including the cost per employment and some of the other information out there. So with that, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Ms. Ejmira. Thank you, Mr. Bartman. Oh, and when will the pre-read materials be sent out for this budget workshop? Uh, we will, uh, the answer to last workshop's um, Q&As should be sent out by the end of the day. Um, and the pre-read materials, the only thing it would be is the, the mapping materials um, that we're working on, which we intend to put into the, uh, the binder for you when we give you the presentations. Got it. And if you can go back to the chat slide, but I saw increased investments. In, in which slide? Yes. Oh, okay, this, gotcha. Okay. Uh, I do see the key themes here being increased operating investments to address uh, concerns that's been that have come up. Uh, could you also? What I would like to see is a side-by-side -side comparison of previous budget cycle to what is being proposed. Got it. Yep, we can do that. Okay. And Madam Chair, Ms. Mayfield also had a question. Ms. Mayfield? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Bergman, <clears throat> for the next slide, presentation four, <coughs> excuse me, water and stormwater budget outlook, can you please check in with staff to let them know? Also come prepared to answer a question regarding current projects that we're having. We're getting, I believe my colleagues have also received emails, but I've recently been getting calls regarding sinkholes that are happening on residential property or right outside residential property that is because of failing infrastructure and that's causing some challenges in neighborhoods where we have approved a lot of new development. So it would be helpful if they are prepared to come and speak to that a little bit when we're talking about our infrastructure needs, because we know we have a lot of piping out there that is corroding, that is older. Well, if what we're approving is causing challenges for our residents, whereas one individual, one of our elders actually fell into a hole mm -hmm. that was created in their backyard, and they were told that that is not city's responsibility, even though they did not have them challenges prior to a development that was approved by council, that would be helpful. Yep, we'll make Thank sure you. they're prepared to talk about that. Committee members, any other questions? Madam Chair, I would like to, would like to yeah. follow up on Ryan. Um, 
I just want to make sure we capture it on March 9th at workshop number two. I know we talked about compensation and staffing and one new initiative, uh, workforce development. I requested uh, uh, $500,000 for three people. I just want to make sure that's captured uh, as we move forward, uh, making sure we can, our budget reflect our priorities. Yep. So. Uh your request is captured, and additionally, you asked some questions specific to workforce development and staffing, and those will be in the uh, Q&As that we give out tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Anderson, do you have anything? No, Madam Chair, I don't have any additional questions or comments. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Bergman, I just requested um, sort of side-by-side -side comparison to the previous year's budget. Could you also include an actual column, so budget of previous year and what was actually spent? Yes. Uh, for FY22, we can do that. FY23, we, we wouldn't be able to yet, of course. Right. I get it. Okay. Well, I looks like... Uh, with this, we don't have any additional questions on the budget outlook, so we can move on to the next topic. So the next topic we have is the evaluation process for appointed staff. Um, the city council has three direct reports, city manager, city attorney, and city clerk. And uh, we have this annual process of evaluating each one of them. So Ms. Uh, Sheila Simpson will walk us through what the current process is and what I'm looking forward to is hearing from the committee members as to what changes we should be making uh, for this to this process and um, and if we should also make any changes in terms of the timing. So with that, um, Ms. Sheila, if you can walk us through the current process. Good afternoon. And thank you again, Ms. Uh, Ashmere. Uh, yes, I'll be glad to walk you through um, the question that was posed and the current process and also best practices. So in terms of the question that was asked, uh, there were two, two basic statements. One, one was, how do we assess and make recommendations on spe specific recommendations on how to improve and have an effective performance evaluation process for the three appointees? The second request was to ascertain from the council suggestions and recommendations that you have to improve the process for both the appointees and yourself as a board. Next slide. Thank you. So to do that, the first step we took was to look through a legal framework for what those positions are and how does the North Carolina statute read in terms of what those positions are, the purpose of those roles, and how they are appointed? And then secondly, what does our city ordinance have in place around those positions as well? Then secondly, we have a slide that outlines general best practices of an evaluation process. And then we have a slide that tells you what we currently do today. And then lastly, as Ms. Ashmere just said, we would like to have uh, feedback and input from you in terms of what would you like to see differently in this process. Next, that covers the city attorney position, the city manager position, and the city clerk. And as you can see, the city attorney, sh attorney shall be appointed by city council. The city manager shall be appointed by the city council. The city clerk is stated to be that there should be one, there shall be one, okay, for the state, okay. Now, if you move further down under the city charter, the city charter uses similar language that the city, uh, that the North Carolina statute uses for the manager and the uh, attorney. The city charter states that the council shall appoint the manager, the clerk, and the attorney, all of whom serve at the pleasure of city council. Next slide. With that, in terms of performance review best practices, the very first thing is to discuss an evaluation process and a review process. And council generally does that, uh, and we repeat that process over time. And then periodically, such as today, 
we will review our current state and decide if there are any changes that you would like to have in this process. The second step is you, you have a summary of the accomplishments and the goals for the next year. And you always provide honest feedback and you complete some type of instrument to provide that feedback. Today, we complete a survey that is electronic. We send it to all council members. Council members evaluate uh, criteria for each of the positions. And that criteria is derived from your council priorities. So just as a reminder for you, in January, the council uh, held a strategy session. And in that strategy session, you discussed your city priorities. In addition to that, you also discussed your city initiatives that align to those priorities. That information is then used to um, define the roles and responsibilities and the performance evaluation process for this city manager. Sorry. It's okay. It's not another one at home. No, no, okay. Well, okay. Familiar. We just have a technical area in here, so the city manager, and then also we map something similar for the city attorney and then the city clerk by their roles. Okay. So just as a quick reminder, the city priorities were great neighborhoods, safe communities, economic development, transportation and planning, and well-managed government. The city initiatives that you all discussed was affordable housing, Charlotte 2040 plan, corridors for opportunity, mobility, higher Charlotte, small and minority business development, and digital divide. That's just a, a uh, refresher for you. Next slide. So in terms of best practices, you ascertain performance goals and objectives. That's always tied to your priorities. And then after that, you focus on where you want your organization outcomes to be. Where do you want your, your primary time to be spent? What are the highest priorities? And how do you uh, evaluate those things? Then based on the criteria that you have established with your appointees in terms of helping them set their priorities, uh, you would then evaluate their performance. It is a mutual process. So it is a continuous process as well. So the feedback that you're providing should be ongoing throughout the year. The evaluation itself is just a more formalized process to aggregate your individual feedback to each of your appointees. But the process should be occurring all throughout the year, giving them all feedback. And then we have a meeting, a conference meeting. In that conference meeting, it is attended by each of your appointees separately and the board. And when you attend the conference meeting, the appointee is having a discussion with you. And you're reprioritizing with that appointee for the next year, but you're also summarizing what happened in the previous year. And then you also discuss gaps and opportunities for improvement. Okay, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, lastly, in terms of the instrument that we provide, uh, we provide a, a way for all council members to provide feedback. In terms of a best practice, it is a best practice that that feedback is not anonymous. And when you map that to how uh, organizations are ran, typically an employee does not receive anonymous feedback from their boss. Right. So that's, that is part of the best practice. Next slide. So in our current process, we have uh, the Human Resources Department. We coordinate with the mayor's office and we determine a path forward in terms of when to have the performance evaluation. And council has decided that each of these evaluations should be near the beginning of the fiscal year, okay? We will distribute, we, meaning human resources, will distribute an instrument to you so we can ascertain and capture your feedback. You provide the feedback for each one of your appointees. They're separate processes, although I'm talking about them together, but they're all separate processes. Then you meet to have a performance conference with your appointee. Prior to that, I should have say, said this, your appointee also assesses themselves and provides you a list of their accomplishments. And that list is derived from the things that they have done and performed that directly relates to your council priorities that we just discussed earlier, how you set those priorities. They provide you that feedback. You take that feedback along with other information that you may have 
and then you are evaluating them on a performance instrument. In that instrument, you have a, a way to provide a numerical uh, rating system, but also a comment section for every one of the performance dimensions, you're able to provide specific comments for your appointee. You have a meeting in private with your appointees, and then when the appointee leaves the room, you discuss as a board how you would like to compensate that individual. And when you make that compensation decision, you approve it formally in an open session meeting. Next slide. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So for this year, you have determined that you would like to hold the performance meeting for each one of your appointees on these dates. For the city manager, it would be held in June, June 20th, the city clerk, uh, June 26th, and the city attorney in July, July 10th. Those are the proposed dates for those performance evaluations. And lastly, <clears throat> Uh, this is a time for you all to give me feedback in terms of what part of the process would you like to change, as Ms. Ashmera said, uh, what changes would you like to make? In addition to that, are there any changes you would like to see in terms of the time frames? Thank you so much, Ms. Simpson. And I also appreciate the pre-read materials that you provided. I did get an opportunity to look at the state statute language in our city charter, so thank you for that. Um, a couple of things in terms of feedback to this process, I would like to see some sort of consistency so that we are doing the evaluation every year at the same time so that there are no surprises. Um, and um, second is I would like committee's feedback on whether we should have an independent firm assist us throughout this process. I have seen um, where other cities will hire an independent uh, third party, a consulting firm that will be assisting the council with the process in lieu of HR. Um, so those are just two things that I have for now. I would like to hear from the committee in terms of their feedback. So why don't we just go around the room here and uh, get your feedback. Let's start with Mr. Vice Chair and then we'll followed by Ms. Mayfield and Ms. Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and so I do have, if we can go to the slide, current evaluation process. Because. Uh, I would like for us to add a new evaluation to. I think we heard some of this from our last evaluation period. And I think we need to have a 360 feedback. Um, I think a 360 degree feedback allow council to get comfortable that those three, when you think of the leaders we have, the city attorney, the city clerk, and city manager, I would like to, I think it would be helpful to get feedback. How do they get along with their colleagues? How do they get along with their staff? And more importantly, as we talk about succession planning, it would give us a good idea about is there, do they think the talent is within the staff or just a future process we have to go outside? And so I think a 360 feedback is something to be helpful too because our memory came up with the, uh, with some of the conversation about the city clerk. I love Stephanie to death. I know what Stephanie does because I'm engaged with her so often. Uh, but there's a question always come about uh, how many of us engage with her and what does she really do? I think if we got a 360 feedback, Stephanie, other team members would tell all of us what great job she's doing, how she's grooming her staff, and how she, she addresses having uh, staff that will uh, fill vacancy. So I hope I get support of the committee to add a 360 feedback as a new criteria. Uh, the, the other question I'll ask Madam Chair is on evaluation dates. And I would like that we be consistent to your point and do all the evaluations the month of June. July 1st is a new fiscal year for us. And I think we need to put 
we need to have all of them consistent. I mean, we got June 20th, June 26th, and then we don't have the city attorney's evaluation to the new fiscal year, which is July 1. If we can keep all of them in the month of June, I just think that flow very easily with this council. Bless you, Mayor Pro Tem. As we kick off July 1, the new fiscal year, we will have all the evaluations and all the uh, uh, salary adjustments in hand. Uh, the, the last thing uh, I would just like to say is, somehow I think we need to have a tool, uh, Ms. HR, that matches you articulate our priorities. I think a lot, though, we don't have those priority lines aligned with the three people we kind of responsible for, and that's how we like to measure them. So somehow there could be a tool uh, that, you know, here's the city manager, here's our priorities. How did he do well on those priorities? Here's a city clerk. I think I, one thing I got really excited about Stephanie, how she has streamlined the nomination process. That used to be a nightmare, but her staff with Kurt have made that almost a seamless process. So we can have some type of criteria to match priorities based on a performance, uh, I think will be very helpful. Uh, and then, uh, Madam Chair, to your point, having an outside uh, consultant to come in, um, I, I'd like to hear more about that. I mean, I, I think our HR do a great job of doing it right now, uh, but if it's a best practice from other cities, I, I would like to hear the pros and cons. So uh, Sheila hasn't complained yet and I, uh, uh, about her staff taking that responsibility, and uh, I would love for it to stay inside, but I'd like to get your thoughts on um, having an outside evaluator to work with HR. So uh, those are my thoughts, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitchell. Um, I agree with you. Sheila has been doing a great job. Um, but you know, it, it gets a little difficult to assist when your boss is getting evaluated. So I think if it's an independent uh, process where we actually have consultant, uh, consulting firm who have done this with other cities, have experience, but then also directly, re directly report to the city council, uh, we can make this process um, just more independent. Um, in terms of your feedback around three, 360 degree uh, from subordinates, I think that's a great idea. And we both agree on the timeline that it's got to be consistent, whatever timeline that uh, council comes up with, whether it's June, it might be difficult to do all three evaluation in one month. So if it's like May to June, June timeframe, where we do two or in May and one in June, whatever it is that we work out, um, but it's just gotta be consistent. And in terms of priorities reflecting, um, uh, we gotta make sure that our priorities reflect everything that we do. Uh, also, I would like to include our state statute and charter requirements as one of our evaluation criteria that all of this, just the basic state statute requirements are uh, sort of being checked off as we go through the evaluation process. So that's all I have. Okay, um, so Madam Chair, once you've already identified, once I speak and Council Member Anderson, I also want to acknowledge that Mayor Pro Tem would like to speak um, after Council Member Anderson as well. So as for committing for the idea of an outside consultant, I would rather we stay within our process, our HR director, presents the information. Unfortunately, council has gone even previously with not reviewing staff in a timely manner. And therefore, this most recent reviews had to encompass the previous year and the current year. Unless that is a request coming from HR, I don't see a need for us to identify a new budget line item to pay an outside group to come into our city when we have highly capable staff right here, if we would just actually adhere to when staff sends the information out to council, if we actually completed our surveys and did the work that we need to do on the front end. I do agree that we 
can look at moving that time up. Keeping in mind, we're in the beginning of April right now. So now we're backdating, so we need to definitely check with HR for the feasibility, even if it's that last week of May or that second, that since we're looking at June 20th and 26th, if it's that looking at that week of June the 12th to the 16th, to try to get them all in in our fiscal time, we want to be respectful of making sure that we're not creating an undue burden by trying to get it back to May. So I would definitely be relying on our HR director and team to let us know the best way to back that in. And I am glad that my colleagues like the 360 idea, which I submitted to HR last year. So for me, it wasn't really for our city clerk, because as you mentioned, Councilmember Mitchell, I know what our city exactly. clerk does. <laughs> so, and have been very engaged with not only how she makes sure we have everything we need, but what her role has been on the international level mm -hmm. as the head of city clerks and how she's kept the city at the forefront. My greater concern was making sure that 360 that we were able to truly evaluate the city manager. I personally had a number of concerns of his management team and things that were happening in the community regarding hitting our diversity and equity goals, regarding how we have supported and or created opportunities through our minority and small business enterprises, how things were falling through the cracks and the way to, for me, to hold the staff accountable, especially in procurement and other departments where I've had to have meetings with business owners and with different leaders in the community is through the city manager's office. So he needs to be accountable for the decisions that his staff makes, including, unfortunately, another most recent decision where you receive a text message instead of a phone call and then council finds out about it six to eight months later. So the 360 for me was to ensure that we have a very clear and level feel for all three individuals that we are responsible for language says appointing, hiring, and or firing those three positions. In order for us to be effective, then we need to be able to have a way for staff to participate because, and I have shared this with our director of HR, I'm concerned with the high turnover that we're having in our executive leadership team. I am concerned that when we have an individual who is about to retire and challenges happen where others who probably should have something written in their file regarding how they have interacted and not proceeded with the stated and voted upon priorities of this council, how are they being managed? That can only be addressed on our end through the reported the reporting system of the city manager, the city clerk, and the city attorney. For our HR director, you did state our priorities again. It would have been great if in this PowerPoint yeah. presentation yeah. that slide was added exactly. so that we can be reminded right. on what our priorities are because I don't know if all of council remembers what we've decided right. on right. as far as our priorities so that we can be consistent when we're having these discussions. And as Madam Chair and Vice Chair mentioned, making sure that we have the right priorities mm -hmm. associated with the right team member because I'm not expecting to have the same priorities right. for the city manager that I have for the city clerk. Right. But within our priorities, what are the, what we should be focusing on for our clerk, for our attorney, our expectations, and for the city manager. The city manager is gonna have a lot more expectations and my personal expectation is there is a lot more scrutiny in that role because you play a much greater part and how we grow when we as a council have adopted a policy of this being a great place to work. Right. Our, when we have over 100 positions that have been vacant and if those positions have been vacant from anywhere from six months to two years, there's a challenge. If we all are out in community and people are coming up to us, whether that's at the grocery store, at Walgreens, wherever it's at, to say that they applied for a position with the city and can't even receive a call back, 
or any type of response, that doesn't fall on our HR director. That falls on those indiv individual departments. That falls on the city manager. What are your department leads doing? And once it's very clear that the expectation is that he will be evaluated differently, that will then trickle down for his staff to know that they will be evaluated differently because the way that they show up in this very diverse community that we have is going to be a direct reflection on his report. Those things, I think, are very important, and it would create consistency. I believe our HR director had already started pulling some, pulling some information together from, for us last year mm -hmm. when we were going through the review process. If you need additional time, please let us know, because from my colleagues, as well as from my initial recommendation for us to do this via email to all of the staff, as well as to our director, if you have the ability to get that in place in time for this current review, mm -hmm. that will be helpful. I will hope that it will for the simple fact that we started the conversation right. previously to try to get a line. But I definitely want to reiterate the idea of us identifying another budget line item to bring some outside consultant in to basically oversee our HR department is not something that I would support unless that is something that our HR director specifically says that they need or they would want in order for them to do their job. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Mayfield. Um, Ms. Simpson, would you be able to tell us in North Carolina, other cities, uh, evaluation process um, and how it is currently being done. I know that's not something you would be able to provide today, but I would like to get that report uh, before our next committee meeting. Uh, Ms. S. Mary, yes, I can get that for you. Yeah, yeah I'd be interested and in seeing, you know, uh, how many other cities are using outside consulting firm to evaluate, to help evaluate um, city manager, city attorney, and city clerk versus uh, using HR. Yes, I could do that. And to answer the, to answer the mm -hmm. other question that came up in terms of time frame. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, from an administrative perspective, HR will be able to meet a May, June timeline for all three. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the root question is about changing your official calendar to accommodate your, your request. Okay. Madam oh, Chair, you. one more, just one more clarification, because I yeah. think there may, since all of this goes in the minutes, I just want to clarify what I thought I heard, because our HR director isn't evaluating her boss. She is just providing us the information. We are the ones that are doing the evaluation for the city manager, the city clerk, and the city attorney. So if we're going to get information as far as what is considered best practices, I, wanted to, I want to make sure that we're doing an apples to apples comparison. Because if other communities, if they have a process where it's not the council that's doing the evaluating, then that's not going to be helpful for us. But I want to make sure that we're clear in the language that we're using because you do not evaluate your bosses. You're providing the information to counsel for us to be able to evaluate the three individuals that we are charged by statute to evaluate, correct? Yes, ma'am, you are correct. From the information we do have, uh, our process, our current process is extremely consistent across the state. And uh, with that basic process being that the board or the council uh, evaluates their appointees. And uh, the question that I thought I was answering was Ms. Ashmere's question, which was, uh, do any of these cities hire an external firm to help facilitate that process? So I did not ask that question of our other affiliates. And so I, I will go ahead and ask that question, Ms. Ashmere. Uh, however, to your point, Ms. Mayfield, uh, by far, the cities evaluate, the council members of those cities evaluate their appointees. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for clarifying that, um, that it is HR or whether it's a third party, all they're doing is helping us gather the information. So in terms of 360 degree feedback, 
um, they will help us gather the feedback, whether it's HR or third party consulting firm, they'll help us gather the feedback and provide us, uh, provide to the council so that ultimately we can do the evaluation. With Ms. that, um, Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, I thank my colleagues for the previous comments. Um, I just have a, a few points. One is, it, I think we need to be clear on the framework for evaluation. And if the understanding that I've that I heard earlier is the city priorities are effectively the objectives um, of these three individuals that we manage, the city manager, um, the attorney, and the clerk, then I I believe we need to that's fine if there are guiding principles, but I think we need to have some additional dot points under each for each one of these positions that get get further down to what we're really looking for them to deliver as it relates to outcomes, right? So I feel like our city priorities can be, you know, an overarching um, vision or mission. Um, statement for these three individuals, but there's different levels of specificity relative to the roles that they play um, that I believe as a board, we should be looking at from an outcomes perspective. So if we are, and I, and I am in alignment of modifying the timeline of evaluation to align with our fiscal year uh, beginning and end, I think that that is a, a, a good alignment. Um, however, we just went through an evaluation process just a few months ago. And so this would be a truncated year of evaluation. And, um, and we still have not, um, to my knowledge, provided a mid-year evaluation or a mid-year observation. And as I mentioned a few months ago, when we went through this process, I'm opposed to having new comments and perspectives come out at the end of the year when none of those perspectives have been shared throughout the, the entire year. So I think we, we owe all three individuals that opportunity to get some feedback from us mid-year or somewhere within the actual performance year. So if we are moving towards truncating an evaluation year to align with our fiscal year, which I agree with, I do believe that we should be providing some level of mid-year feedback or interim feedback now, and then that is overdue. So um, that's that's my perspective on that topic. Um, if in any way, shape, or form, we are looking to modify the evaluation process <clears throat> of any of these three individuals that we manage, then I do believe we need to look at best practice that occurs throughout the state as well as other states um, and potentially tap into a third party to assure that we are setting up the right structure and framework um, so that there's transparency in how these individuals will be evaluated and transparency in our expectation of performance um, from the very beginning. And so, if we're not modifying that process, then I, I'm i not quite sure that we need a third party involved, but if we are modifying that process, I think we, we probably should tap into some objectivity and um, expertise of a third party to help usher us through that process. In addition to the 360 evaluation, which I'm certainly not opposed to, um, but when you have a 360 evaluation to the, the chair's earlier point, that is effectively allowing um, city manager and, and, and clerk and attorney staff to have input in their evaluation. And so if someone is providing input or certain entities are providing input into an evaluation and managing the evaluation process, you just want to make sure that you know you have arm length transaction there, and that 
um, that process is managed appropriately. So I don't know that that means that we need to hire a third party or if we need to potentially have a council member or an, uh, a, a working group council of council be a part of that overarching process as a steering committee. Um, but I, I do think we just need to be thoughtful about that. Um, if we're going to introduce the 360, which I am certainly um, aligned with. And then lastly, I just really want to make sure, you know, when we, when you get to an end of the year evaluation, we need to be speaking to what those objectives are that we laid out at the beginning of that year for either one of these three individuals. And if we are doing an assessment on something that we haven't laid out as an objective or an area of focus, then it's not really aligned with how we set out our expectations because that's going to dictate behavior and actions throughout the, the, the evaluation year. So if we have not done that this year um, in, a, in a manner that we feel really good about, then I, I really believe as we transition into this new fiscal year, June, July, that we set out those objectives and areas of focus in a very clear, um, digestible, transparent way for all three individuals. Thank you, Madam Chair. Great input, uh, Ms. Anderson. Uh, I, I think you uh, hit the nail on the head because when we talk about 360 degree evaluation, uh, you're right. We had to be very thoughtful about how we go about that, where subordinates are comfortable sharing honest feedback. Um, so if it's done by uh, either working group of the council or a third party, I think it gives them um, a comfort level. I just want to make sure that uh, whatever process that we are, that council approves and um, builds consensus on, uh, that we are providing that comfortable environment where we are getting honest 360 degree feedback. Uh, and in terms of uh, media, in corporate America, I've seen that, uh, you know, there are no surprises at the end of the year evaluation because a lot of the concerns, if there are any, would be brought up in our media evaluation. So um, I, I think that would be a, something new that we would introduce if that's something committee would like to proceed with. Uh, but that will have to be sort of, let's say if you're starting in June as the year end evaluation, then it will have to be sometime in December November, December timeframe, where we'll be doing a mid-year evaluation. And it uh, looks like there is consensus on 360 degree feedback. Also, there is consensus on uh, being consistent on timeframe, whether it's um, um, May, June timeframe. Um, and in terms of best practices, I also hear from Ms. Anderson that um, we would like to consider what other cities, not just in the state, but other states, what they are doing and whether that's something based on that, if we would like to make any changes. So, um, I know- Madam also, Chair, I remember Mayor Pro Tem Braxton had a comment. Yes, I was just going to introduce him. Okay, I know Mayor Pro Tem, you have, uh, do you have any feedback in this process? Yeah, um, so I think this is a good, good um, conversation. Um, you know, I think back to the policy question, how can council st staff uh, appointees performance be evaluated most effectively? Um, uh, some, of the, some of the things that Ms. Anderson was, was saying really did resonate with me. I think we kind of ran into, we run into trouble um, at times when we're doing these yearly evaluations um, with being able to parse out all of the information and all of the work that we do 
um, and, and are, are supposed to hold our employees accountable for over, over the year. Uh, so sometimes, so what Ms. Anderson said, I think is true, sometimes we'll bring in new information, right? Um, um, of course, we're dealing with, and when we're running a city, um, the flavor of the day, <laughs> you know, what's in the cycle of that week can sometimes put blinders on a lot of other things that have happened on the other, you know, 51 weeks um, 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 surrounding that work. So sometimes um, it's more favorable because the budget worked out, you know, and, 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 and kind of um, amass some, some other issues, for instance, that we were dealing with. Or there might be a certain a uh, lawsuit in, in the news that um, might take up all, all of our energy. Um, we don't really have a great way to kind of object, uh, um, uh, uh, objectively um, recall um, some of those priorities, some of those um, requested outcomes um, and, and evaluate those. So I don't know if that's that's a outside consultant or a member of staff, <laughs> you know, that really works with the city council to track these things, <laughs> you know, questions that we ask um, to get information from and feedback, for instance. Sometimes we literally just don't remember <laughs> because it was done in a memo sometimes seven and a half months ago. Um, and they did their part um, but it might have not been up to our expectations because they literally did what we asked them to do um, and we didn't provide the feedback because it got lost, right? So, so um, on top of that, we have our defined um, group priorities, but we are 11 bosses, 12 bosses, right? That we have our own individual relationships and, and, and workflows with, and those are valid um, parts of the evaluation process, but there's no way we don't have any kind of structure that um, where we can kind of de demarcate and also share those bits of information. And I think those things um, are, are, are real important uh, when, when we're, 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 we're trying to make um, decisions. I honestly, I don't know if it's as much of a 360, I'm, I'm, I, this 360 evaluation doesn't really speak to me um, as much as being able to evaluate the guidance and expectations that the 12 of us give, right? If, if they're providing the outcomes that we expect, that the 12 of us expect, I think that's the most important, right? And understanding what our requests are and how those requests are being fulfilled. There's no, nothing that really does that. We have questionnaires and things like that, but again, the recall of information, there's no way to, to, to really work with a staff member to go through, go through those things, right? We're not going through all of our text messages and emails month to month to say, hey, what did I, what did I, what, what, what did I ask of the manager or the clerk or, or, or uh, the attorney, and, and, to, and, and, and how did they respond to that to hold them accountable? And I think that is something that we really do need. Uh, again, I don't know how you get there, um, but it's missing. And, and we end up having either, again, either kind of flavor of the day <laughs> um, analysis or even sometimes emotional analysis, and I, I don't think that's always fair. Thank you. I mean, Simpson wants to respond. Uh, Mr. Uh, Winston and Ms. Esmera, so one point of uh, clarification that I should make is that if the council decides that you would like to incorporate a 360, uh, a 360 is a defined instrument, okay? So it is not a, it is not a feedback survey, okay? It is literally a defined instrument. And if we were to uh, implement that, that would be administered by a third party, okay? So I just have to be clear, that would be administered for, by a third party. And the other thing that you should be aware of is when that is administered, a 360 is a personal development tool. It is not a performance management tool. So it is used in conjunction with a performance management tool, but it's not a substitute for, okay? So 
when you use that instrument, the feedback that is received by the organization is received by the individual to whom that 360 represents. Okay? So as a body, you should not have an expectation that you're going to see all of the feedback that someone provided on, as an example, the city clerk's 360. Okay? Because that instrument is a personal development instrument. So I just want to be clear on expectations that if you really want to use a 360, it's at your liberty to do that. Uh, the board would decide, not for me to decide, it's for you to decide. But if you were, we would certainly use a third party to administer that. Just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Simpson, for clarifying that. I wasn't aware that 360 was done by the outside um, third party, so that's great. Uh, but I do want to go back to Mr. Winston's point because he raises a, a good point because Oftentimes, there are requests that comes through. Uh, we all send an email or during our one on one meetings, whether it's with city manager, city attorney, where we ask for a specific information or specific issue to be resolved. And there is no tracker, but there is no tracking tool where some of those some of that issues are being addressed in a timely fashion or some of them are getting lost. So we do need to address that as part of this um, uh, evaluation criteria. How do we keep track of all the questions that are being asked by the council that are being addressed in a timely fashion? Um, and I don't know an answer to that. I think that's something we got to raise um, and, <clears throat> and figure out how do we get that addressed. Um, and Mr. Winston also said something that really resonated with me uh, when he shared that this evaluation process sometimes uh, when it's done at a particular time, it's more emotions uh, driven uh, where it it's, may not be uh, objective. Um, and I, I think we got to address that as well as part of the um, as part of this process, uh, but with the introduction of 360, there will be it will be adding a new step, and um, it would be considered modifying our current process. So, anything else that committee members have? I have written down all the points that committee member have raised in terms of the process, and I'm, I look forward to full council's feedback on all of that and any additional feedback that they might have for us. Hey, looks we don't have anything else. Uh, I'll present this later tonight to the full council and uh, I look forward to their recommendations as well uh, before we have the next steps on this. All right, well, uh, without further ado, we have third item and I know we have uh, guest speakers for that. Uh, we have committee chair, um, Mr. Caleb Theodros, and I also heard Ms. Carolyn Millen is also in the room who serves on the Equitable Development Commission. And this group has been working hard to provide us with recommendations. Um, I know we have talked about equity and how important that is for the council where all the voices are heard. Um, so as part of that process uh, and part of the 2040 plan, uh, there was an equitable development commission that was formed last year uh, where we wanted to make sure as we are investing in our infrastructure, we are really taking equity lens uh, as part of this investments. Uh, and I would like to hear from Caleb and Ms. Millen on in terms of what their recommendations are and what the commission's recommendations are. But I certainly appreciate the dedication of your team um, and so many hours that's been spent on this to, to gather um, feedback for us. So, Caleb, are you in the room? Yep, on the <clears throat> council member, I'm here. Yeah, and thanks so much for that uh, introduction and all the council members that were able to join us. Um, over the past maybe uh, about a year, we've 
um, been trying to inform ourselves about different ways we can kind of guide uh, developments in the city, um, and obviously through an equitable lens. And so uh, we received presentations from everyone from um, <clears throat> the Budget Committee, uh, the CIP, Corridors of Opportunity, uh, and really tried to focus our attention on you know, specific actionable items we can bring uh, before the uh, council members. One thing uh, we continue to, to see, and that's really where our recommendation uh, lies, is around the community engagement. And so um, we were thinking that, you know, just looking at it from a first principle lens, oftentimes there is a disconnect between the information that council members and even staff get from the community. And so there aren't necessarily uh, standards uh, citywide. And so what we wanted to do, um, and, and kind of the points that our recommendations um, uh, discusses is the two main points, and I quickly have uh, bullet points on these two items. Um, so the biggest thing is um, the, the CIP dashboard. So the CIP dashboard um, gives a very good kind of outline over projects that are going on throughout the city using CIP funds. Um, it was a bit of a surprise to me and even um, uh, folks on the committee because I had no idea this thing existed. Um, and I'm relatively informed on what's going on and other, other folks on our, our board as well. And so we wanted to um, uh, give certain suggestions over how we can essentially get the word out on the dashboard. And so there are a couple of, uh, of points that we've made, whether it's linking the dashboard to the CLT Plus app, um, adding information to the 311 homepage, um, another point was the project description uh, should also include the feedback. So folks that haven't necessarily seen the dashboard with each project, it essentially outlines um, how much money it's taking for the project, where the project is located, certain timelines. But also we wanted feedback from the community. So if there's a project four miles from my house, I should also see what the community members said about that project. Um, and so we, we also wanted to see that um, added. Uh, and, and the last point on the uh, dashboard was leveraging uh, social media and an array of community outreach tools. Um, we, we wanted to, uh, to include social media, not only because you know, folks are using it more, but even a sort of a bang for your buck in um, uh, informing citizens. We, we think people should be informed um, through social media and a bit more diverse set of tools. And so um, I guess the thinking around this is, you know, we, we, we're trying to look for ways to maybe introduce certain guidelines, but if there are also excellent tools that already exist, citizens uh, should be informed. And so the overall ask for that second CIP dashboard is um, uh, maybe a campaign of some sort uh, to raise awareness around it so, so folks know about it. Um, the other point was around the community engagement standard operating procedure. And so, um, like I said initially, um, citywide, we essentially wanted a set of standards set out for how community engagement is brought in. This is for maybe city infrastructure projects um, or different uh, major city programs. And so, the, we, we saw a lot of disconnect over uh, certain standards, maybe engineering department um, has their own standards of how many folks we should talk to before a project. It might be disengaged from uh, the folks that are in the um, uh, community engagement division. And so um, uh, overall, we wanted a certain set of structures and some of the points that we outlined was, um, a, a, we wanted to support the guiding principles already established by the community engagement division. They did do some work in uh, outlining uh, certain bullet points over um, essentially the values behind the community engagement tool and a lot of it was based around equity. So we definitely wanted to, to second that and give our statement of support. Uh, second item. Uh, is ensuring, obviously, uh, engagement staff are aware of projects and programs. Um, there are certain uh, community relation positions where you know people within the city are focused on this specific uh, area within Charlotte, and you know their entire job is to essentially keep a communication with the community. However, oftentimes they're not even informed of some of the projects in their um, uh, in their area, and so this kind of speaks to some of the disconnects that may be taking place, and, and we wanted to ensure that they were also in the loop as far as what projects are going on. Um, third point was the standard operating procedure uh, must request that each community engagement venture uh, must first indicate the public participation goal as outlined in the IAP2 spectrum of public transportation, oh, excuse me, participation. So that's um, this page outlined uh, right here. And so uh, the IAP2 um, tried to set up a framework for what community engagement is like. Uh, every, the next slide. Um, oh, yeah, I believe so, yeah. Um, 
it's on the next slide, but it essentially uh, laid out a framework of what community engagement um, looks like. And so not every project is the same. Are you looking to inform citizens? Are you looking to consult? Um, or do you want them a lot more involved? Are you looking to collaborate, empower, et cetera? And so before coming out and saying uh, we want to engage with the community, uh, whatever project or city staff should outline what is the goal uh, of what you're trying to accomplish. And so because, you know, informing looks a lot different than, than consulting. Um, and so uh, another point, uh, probably, probably the bigger one, was the quantifiable metrics uh, in terms of community members engaged. And so um, we laid out a couple of bullet points and maybe what that should be based off of, but we were looking at uh, investment size of the project, location of the project, uh, type of projects and public participation goal. And so these are outlines, we, we're not the subject matter experts over what these specific metrics would look like, but it's very important that there are metrics. I think oftentimes we have these uh, lofty goals and we say, you know, um, the, the point of this community engagement, uh, we wanna be diverse. What does that even mean? Like what percentage of folks are you trying to talk to? Um, you know, this project is happening here. So maybe we want, uh, feedback from 20% of the population within a three mile radius of this project. We're looking for very specific goals, uh, and I think that, um, uh, well, as a, as a committee, the city uh, staff should essentially um, give us those goals. Um, and also, you know, all of those goals don't necessarily have to be measured. Like, we don't know what a good job or a bad job right now really is because those goals aren't really set in stone. And so, what this will do is if a project comes up to council and says, um, our, our, uh, our stated goal was to talk to 20% of the population within a mile. We weren't able to do that. We only spoke to about 10%. This is actual feedback for them to essentially go back and suggest where do we come up short on. And so it's more so a feedback uh, mechanism for them because, you know, we had conversations with the community engagement division and, um, you know, I'm sure we were, we were kind of shocked to, to, to hear that there wasn't even a social media expert um, that worked with the team. And so in this day and age, um, you should have. And I think that these metrics will allow folks to see whether we're doing a good job, are we talking to enough people, when we're presenting the budget, how many percentage of the population have we talked to, um, and so, uh, et cetera. But th these are kind of the overall guidelines. And a specific, uh, a couple more points is, uh, the city's website should include feedback from each project. And so um, that's more so uh, kind of like what we were saying with the CIP um, dashboard, but I think, you know, we can't only say we want community feedback if we're not letting folks know what that community feedback is. Because I think oftentimes community engagement is, you know, we have this email, email us, uh, let us know what you think. Well, we, we don't know. Well, so city should know, like this project passed and there were 200 negative emails about it. So, you know, folks should know how the community felt before something was passed. And I think transparency uh, around that would be good. Uh, another point, the city's website should include the metrics set for each community engagement campaign. So the metrics we spoke of earlier, uh, when we're p posting it on the website, it should say the goal of this uh, project is to talk to 15% or whatever that goal is, but it should at least state it. Um, and then uh, lastly, the standard operating uh, procedure must include qualitative feedback on how community engagement shaped the project. So this is more so, we, we talked a lot about uh, quantifying these metrics, but we also wanted uh, a personal uh, touch to this. And so what that looks like, I think, um, is up to city staff or whoever um, essentially works on this, but uh, there needs to be feedback from the community over uh, what this will look like. And so this is um, sort of the main areas that our uh, uh, commission has uh, essentially focused on because, and, and tying that back to development, you know, I think whether you look at specific problems over, you know, the number of sidewalks within the city, it's, you know, essentially, okay, well, uh, what is the budget for it? What does the community think? So uh, no matter what issue we were talking about, about development, it kept going back to community engagement. So we felt like this is um, a very specific and important area that we wanted to focus our attention on, uh, which is why our uh, initial recommendation around this is around community engagement. I don't know, Carolyn, if you wanted to add anything to that? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you all for letting me be here today, and I really wanted to say thank you for letting me be a part of this commission. We have a phenomenal group, and. And staff, thank you, because y'all have to decipher what we're all coming out with. But we really want to make sure that, especially with the 2040 plan and the UDO, that 
we can reach out and bring as many of the community as possible to the table because we go out every day and we hear from community and they're like, I didn't even know this was going on or I don't feel like anybody's hearing me. And we really need to bring as many people and be as transparent as possible bringing to the table. And I think what Caleb covered and what we've brought to y'all today is a great beginning to do that. Because we, uh, you all know we have a handful of stuff come June 1st that we're gonna be getting hit with and we need to make sure there's equitable balance across this city and again, bringing everybody to the table. So thank you very much. If there were any questions, we'd be more than happy to answer. Make sure, madam. Thank you so much, Caleb and Ms. Millen. I appreciate the work that you have put in to uh, deliver this. Uh, you are absolutely right. When I often go out in the community, especially neighborhood meetings, um, many residents are not aware of some of the projects that are already underway and ensuring that community voices being heard at every part of the process is very important. In fact, um, last year we had this committee called Triple E, uh, Equity, Engagement, and Environment Committee uh, that has been disbanded, uh, but there was um, multiple deliverables out of that committee and uh, Mr. Winston, uh, I and Ms. Johnson served on that committee, and we wanted to make sure there was some sort of consistency in how we go about engaging our residents, whether it's 2040 plan, whether it's UDO or CIP. Uh, so it's great to hear that um, similar feedback as we were discussing that as part of our AAA committee assignment, that how we engage committee, how we engage residents there's got to be a standard process for that. So maybe this tool will help us with that. Uh, but I look forward to hearing what committee members have to say, especially also Mr. Winston, who, who was part of the AAA committee. So with that, uh, committee members, any feedback? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, let me applaud uh, Carolyn and Caleb for what I call outstanding first steps for us. Uh, just a suggestion, number one, uh, can you go, well, his second slide, we did not have up there, the IPA spectrum of public participation. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a home run when they talk about informed, consultant, involved, collaborating, and power. Uh, one thing I would like, you know, this committee or Caleb, you and Carolyn committee, when you're talking about development, the 2040 plan of UDO, I do think there's one thing we need to have a conversation about, and that is community benefits. Because as development comes into different communities, Caleb, you, you touched on it earlier, one community might want sidewalks on both sides. Another community might need a stoplight due to traffic. And so if you all could, you know, when you look at that and say, maybe here is a, a takeaway or expectations from the community as they participate, here's our benefits. So has there been any discussion about coming up with community benefits as it relates to new development that's coming on? Yeah, uh, we didn't get specifics into actual project. This is more okay. so, even if there is a community benefits uh, program, right. um, it should also follow within the standard that's set. And so okay. this is saying, uh, if this is a program that's being introduced in this neighborhood, right. the, uh, the idea is this standard would also cover that as well. Let's say X amount of people should be spoken to. Right. Uh, and we just want to get as specific as we can to the metric, but it would apply to community benefits or, or really any other infrastructure and uh, uh, programs. Because okay. just as a follow, we uh, I'm getting emails. I think most of my colleagues are now. There's a community benefit group that they meet, and I'm getting emails forward anticipating of June one, uh, allowing the community to have a stronger voice with your metrics as well as giving us feedback. I think it'll go a long way of bridging the community together. And say, how do we develop Charlotte collectively? Because mm -hmm. right now we have this tension: developers, community and somehow we got to bring them together. So thank, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Can I answer? Oh, oh, sure. Just to let you know, there's a member on our commission that is part of the Community Benefits Coalition. Okay, great. So there is communication between yes, the two of you. Madam Chair, did you have anything before I ask the question? No, I don't have anything else to add. Thank okay. you, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, Ms. Mayfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
great presentation. Thank you for the work that you all are doing. So when I look at that same breakdown of the IAP2 spectrum of public participation, I want to make sure that as we move forward that we're clear and as you've already mentioned, transparent with our language. Under Empower, we have promised to the public we will implement what you decide. We're going to need to update that language to be more reflective of we will take into consideration for the simple fact that unfortunately, honestly, a lot of the conversations that we've had in community, which you've sat in on plenty of the meetings, the way the votes come down don't necessarily align with what has been expressed by members of the community. But I really, really love the conversation and the thought process of council and community knowing when there's opposition and having that information readily available because I don't think that as you all mentioned, a lot of people in the community until it hits at their front doorstep, they don't understand all the moving parts. So I definitely support the idea of adding this to the CLT Plus app. We got to do a better job on our end of which staff is already having the conversations of how to promote the CLT Plus app even more for people to utilize it. Because every time we go out and we ask somebody if they've heard of it, we have more people in the room who have not heard of it right. than have. As well as <clears throat> Councilman Mitchell, I think what I also heard was, and Madam Chair, the fact that we need a social, social media, media expert for awesome. that community engagement yeah. team. And that may be something that can be partnered in multiple groups because we also need the same thing in CBI and a couple of other departments where we don't have the social media presence on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Every place that the city has a logo in social media, we should have someone presenting this information because more often than not, we all receive a call or meet someone out in the community and say, well, how do I get more engaged? Right. And we think we have all these ways for people to get engaged, but in actuality, there's some type of void between what we are, what we are putting out and what the community is able to receive. Also, the question that I have is, did you utilize council goals when you were identifying how these five buckets were being utilized because, or being identified with informed, consult, involved, collaborate, and empower? Because I think that will help with reminding the community as well for city council versus county commission versus school board. Here are city council goals. So in these goals, here's where these five buckets fall. Was that part of the conversation that you that the group was able to have? Um, yeah, I, I think we did discuss it yes. um, at some point and, and just, uh, I guess, even addressing the first point. So w we should probably um, edit this chart to ignore the bottom half where you were saying, council member, the, we will implement what you decide. So in our actual recommendation, we only want to utilize the public participation goal. And so just look at the top half uh -oh. of this part. Okay. So just but, but I do like the idea of the promise to the public because yes, we've made promises and it will be helpful if you, the community, can help keep us accountable to the promises that we make. And it's also good feedback for um, council because of the majority of kind of community engagement goals that come before you, if 90% are only to inform, then you can have questions where this project, you should, the city staff should probably consult the community and not only inform. And so um, it, it, it's just laying out metrics that you can essentially follow, and it would be better to judge that way. Well, great job on what the committee has done. So please send our thank yous back to when you have your next meeting. But this was a really great presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, Mayor Pro Tem, Winston has a question, comment. Yeah, yeah just, a, just a comment. I appreciate it. I appreciate um, the 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 work and, and the feedback, um, and, it, and it makes a lot a lot of sense. You know, um, one thing I would, um, I guess, you know, suggest we do as an organization, uh, to the points that were made, realize where our strong and weak points are. City staff, the city of Charlotte, you know, all due respect. We're good at what we do, right? We're good at what we're brought in to do, to make budgets, run water systems, you know, and ensure public safety. We're not always 
the best at communicating outwardly um, and, 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 and across demographics. So when we're thinking about sharing social media, I think Ms. Mayfield you know, was mentioning this um, just a second ago, maybe not focus on how do we increase our social media, our own social media um, uh, footprint, but how do we work with our partners, right? How do we work with our partners in media, for instance, who already have a larger <laughs> um, footprint to provide, um, uh, uh, we have so much information, they're good at delivering information to the people that, that watch them. So how do we maybe improve um, uh, <coughs> those inflows and outflows um, in, in a managed in a, in a manage, uh, uh, fashion? Um, also, I think it was also mentioned, you know, around schools, or, you know, um, again, we're not great at necessarily teaching people, you know, how to learn these very complicated processes. Uh, so do we have opportunities to work with our partners um, in education, for instance, um, um, to, to make this actually available for all types of residents, that because all types of residents should have input in the growth and development and understanding how they can in, interact with the growth and development of the city. So if we're not reaching um, kids in pre-K through 12 and therefore their families or we're not a, you know able to reach college students community college students um, maybe we're missing an opportunity you know what I'm saying to outreach and, not, and I don't just mean putting posters on the wall of the halls I mean actually figuring out a way to um, um, either gamify or or, or uh, uh, create curriculum that, that teaches people how to be um, part of these processes. So let's look to our partners, I guess, you know, to really increase those communication opportunities. Um, we don't want to kind of reinvent the wheel internally. We want to focus on writing growth plans and stuff like that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Winston. I see Ms. Anderson has raised her hand. Ms. Anderson? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll be I'll be brief. I do agree with the comments of my colleagues. Um, I also really like this framework, and I think it lays out a level of um, how we can take action through each of these uh, pillars and columns, and what that action should look like. Um, however, I don't want this to be. This is a great piece of of work that will can guide our actions i don't want it to sort of sit on a shelf and we never really revisit this again I, I feel like this should be something that we always revisit to ensure that we're holding up our promise to the community and to the public um, the other piece i'd like to just speak on is the social media piece and you know we have a a, a very um, good group communication group within the city of charlotte and I think social media should be an area of focus here, but also thinking about how social media is used and how in the ways in which we would disseminate this information. Um, many constituents only receive news through social media. Um, they don't watch television. They don't listen to the radio. Um, and so thinking about how we can tap in and have the right message for that subset of our constituents that really highly engage with social media and with platforms. You know, LinkedIn is very different than Twitter um, versus Instagram. And so thinking about what's the best platform to disseminate the right message for the right target um, audience of our constituents. So great work. Um, on this from the committee. I hope that you will take it a, a step further and, and think about how we can structure a social media plan of action, if you will, based on the right channel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. I also have to recognize uh, Carolyn uh, and even Caleb, they both help us disseminate information um, through their other roles. I know Carolyn is a neighborhood leader uh, for East Ray Sheffield and Caleb is uh, a BPC president, so they help us with the public participation goals. I certainly appreciate the work that you both do in other capacities. Uh, but I look forward to presenting that along with our committee members to full council uh, 
uh, tonight's strategy session and gather their feedback on how can we go about implementing this uh, public participation toolbox. Okay, with that, any other questions, uh, comments before we adjourn? I think that's all we have. Mr. Bartman, did I miss anything? No, that's right. All right, if nothing else, do you have a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second. All right, all in favor, log off, please. Aye. Thanks. Aye.
You says, okay, for me, get started. We're ready. Okay. Good. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Monday, April 3rd meeting of the Jobs and Economic Development Council Committee. My name is Malcolm Graham. I serve as chairman of the committee. I want to take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of you uh, to our committee meeting today as we kick off the month of April. Uh, to um, make sure that we know who's in the room, let's take the opportunity to start with the back wall uh, and introduce um, everyone, uh, and then we'll start at the table next. Maurice Kawan, Chair of the Business Advisory Committee. Chris Nesbitt, Kansas City of Charlotte Economic Development. Monica Holmes, Earth Opportunities, City of Charlotte. Carolyn Miller, Vice Chair of Charlotte East Organization. Todd. Todd Long. Ann Young. Anna Schloin, City Attorney's Office. James Carter, Economic Development. Braxton Winston, Mayor Pro Tem. Ed Driggs, Committee Member. Again, Malcolm Graham, Chairman. Casey Dodson, Assistant City Manager. Thomas Power, City Attorney's Office, Counsel to the CBI Program. Stephen Coker, Business Inclusion Officer, CBI. Renee Askew, Assistant City Manager. Luana Mayfield, City Council Member at Large. And we will introduce those who are joining us virtually. If you can introduce yourselves for us. Hello, this is Marjorie Molina, uh, District 5 and Committee Member. That's it. All right. Well, we have a, um, a, a somewhat short agenda. Um, um, but very important agenda, uh, and I will turn it over to the uh, Economic Development Director to preview the agenda, and then we'll get right into the meeting. Great. Thank you, Councilmember Graham. BI, and um, we'll let Mr. Coker take, take that with Mr. Powers, um, and then I will be back around to talk to you all about the Sullenberger Aviation Museum, as well as current boards and commissions, which was a referral to committees. Thank you, Ms. Dotson. Uh, good afternoon, uh, council committee leadership, uh, council members and, and staff, uh, as well as any guests that might be here. I want to thank you for giving us this opportunity to give you an update on where we are with this policy slash procedures. And in the spirit of, I, I call it Kanai, got that from Tony Robbins, constant and never ending improvement. It's our goal to take this program to the next level. Uh, we've gone down a long road relative to the disparity study and we're now at the point where we've outlined what the, the actual policy and procedures look like. Uh, at any point, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. 
or you can reserve them uh, to the end. Uh, the objectives of this uh, presentation is to discuss the philosophy for the CBI program, outline the CBI policy and manual, highlight the new self-performance opportunity, prioritize the MBE goals and WBE goals going forward, and provide next steps to council committee. New philosophy for the program. Uh, the current CBI policy only focuses on subcontracting opportunities for NWSBEs. In the revised policy, there's a strategy shift which aligns with the new focus on helping more MWSBE subcontractors grow into prime contractors. Uh, the revised policy will focus on contract opportunities regardless of dollar amount. Now relative to the CBI policy and CBI manual, the current policy includes policy and operational components. Uh, policies typically do not contain administrative procedures. And so what we are looking to do is to uh, bifurcate the two, the policy and procedures, make it more digestible, easy to understand. Our current document is 50 pages, uh, packed with all the information, small print. When this is finally completed, we want to have two separate documents. Uh, we're going to dress it up. Uh, with some graphics, we're going to make it nice, colorful, but most important uh, it's the content uh, that's contained in these two separate documents. Uh, the revised policy will address policy and will be adopted by City Council. The revised uh, CBI man manual will address operational components and signed by the manager. And, and the idea here, again, is to make it simple. Uh, when we talk about the manager signing off on this, we, we want to move those simple items that doesn't uh, have the components of policy, but the procedures would be signed off uh, on, by the manager when there are new uh, things that come up. And it's something new coming up all the time. Just most recently, give you an example, uh, we had a meeting with a subcontractor, had a major issue on a project. Uh, and it was something that came to us so late, uh, about almost two years after the problem uh, happened, that we really didn't know how to handle it at that point. We just could only uh, let them know what legally we could do for them. There was much, wasn't much we could do for this subcontractor. So what we want to add is something like a hotline uh, or email address for a subcontractor that has an issue and be able to give them an opportunity to share it with us so that we can uh, deal with that right at the point in time it happens. And these are the kind of things that we don't want to bog down city council with. It's something that we could have uh, internally uh, address uh, within the staff. Uh, the re revised policy overview, it actually is just 10 pages at this point. Uh, it defines the scope of the CBI policy. It outlines the CBI program roles and responsibilities of the city manager, the department heads, uh, the business inclusion officer, and the city attorney's office. Uh, and it also references the actual administrative procedure manual. Uh, it also outlines the city's enabling legislation and a process for adopting the 2022 disparity study. The manual, on the other hand, is 34 pages in length. It provides operational procedures and allows, again, for faster and consistent response, uh, response times to stakeholders and emerging trends. And it requires staff to operate within the authority granted by the city council through CBI policy. If additional authority is needed, then the staff will seek uh, city council uh, permission beforehand. Uh, and, and also would be signed by the city manager as a citywide policy. Uh, Self-performance opportunity. In the previous CBI policy, this didn't allow for MWSBEs to count for any self-performance toward a contract goal. It also required all prime contractors 
uh, to seek MWSBEs uh, for sub as subcontractors, and it inhibited uh, opportunities for our diverse firms to become prime contractors. In the revised, uh, could you just explain self performance? Self performance uh, is uh, a situation where if we have a MBE or an MWBE uh, performing work on a contract. It, in the new revised policy, we would allow the goals to be captured in their work with their workforce as, as opposed to reaching the goals by subcontracting opportunities. Mm. Uh, currently, uh, that's not allowed. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. In the revised uh, policy and CBI manual, this will allow for MWSBEs to use their own workforces towards that contracting goal. Uh, it creates uh, opportunities for MWSBEs to be prime contractors, and it will be offered on uh, solicitations in the new fiscal year or after July 1. Uh, next up. Uh, allow Thomas to speak on uh, CBI goals, goals going forward. Apologize. <clears throat> With the new CBI policy, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that the committee is aware of, as well as the council, is the actual enabling legislation and why we're prioritizing MWBEs as well as WBE goals going forward. As you are fully aware, our program has a minority, uh, minority business component as well as women-owned uh, business component and small business as well. With the new uh, disparity study, one of the things we're doing is aligning what I, patient. what I wanted to emphasize to you today is that the General Assembly created the statute of 143-128.2, which emphasized, again, minority participation and uh, outlined again that this is a statewide standards for minorities as well as women-owned businesses on state contracts. If you can go to the next slide. This aligns in particular for our actual special legislation for small business enterprise uh, program. We've had this legislation since 2002. We've updated it, I think, in 2008 to ensure that it's outside the uh, consolidated market for, for Charlotte. But one of the sections that I've highlighted before you today emphasize that our small business enterprise program is not is intended to supplement but not replace the requirements set forth by state statute which again specifies MWBE participation. For that reason we believe that with the new disparity study and actually our uh, emphasis on uh, minority owned businesses as, as well as women owned businesses we're going to have a focus on those goals going forward and not have a combination of M SBEs or WSBEs, it will be an MBE goal or WBE goal. For those situations where there is no minority businesses are available, uh, we will then have a S goal, but again, it will be no minority businesses or no women-owned businesses. At that opportunity, we would then have an S goal uh, as a possibility. If you can go to the next slide. You want to handle this or you want me? You can go ahead and okay. talk about it. So just to make sure we clarify again, as we're talking about MBE goals, one of the things that I want to make sure that this council is fully aware of is the process that we're going about legally to set MWBE goals. Um, as, again, as I stated before, legally we're going to move in that direction because it aligns with the state authority uh, in that regard as well as our own special legislation. We're not eliminating S, the SBE program. It is only once we have no M's or W's available. So then the the core question becomes, well, what qualifies as an MBE go or a WBE go? So at the bottom, I wanted to make sure that everyone's fully aware of how we're developing this as we're actually setting goals going forward. When we're setting M's or W's, we're looking at a particular scope of work, and there must be at least three firms in that scope of work for competition. If it's one firm, we will not be able to set a goal. So we are still promoting the aspect of actual private sector competition for a prime contractor with our subcontractors in order to set a goal. Uh, again, let me just also allude to, Steve's also talked about the aspect of self-performance. That is, that is a separate aspect. But in the instance where we're setting a goal with a thought a prime contractor is going to get M's or W's, we're always requiring a minimal of three firms in that particular category. 
As such, it has to be in the same scope, not just three minority firms or three women-owned firms. It has to be in the same scope. As such, I gave the example of three uh, MBE architects would allow for a goal to be set because there's three within that category, as well as three WBE security firms would allow for a WBE category. However, if there's one MBE, one WBE uh, landscape or hauler or supplier, that is not enough for competition for us to set a goal. At that point, if that was the only type of scope that was available for this contract, we would not set a goal because there's not enough competition to ensure that we're again promoting not only businesses but also the opportunity for our prime contractors to legally get someone to actually meet your requirements. Uh, again, as I've emphasized beforehand, the, the intent of the program is to remedy disparity. It is not a situation where we're just handing out contracts uh, per se to individuals just because. So we have to make sure legally we're having that competition and that element in each scope. This would allow for us to move forward, but I do want to make sure at least I explain that process to you uh, in, in regards to us moving forward. So, 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 so is it fair to say that we're narrowly tailoring the goals based on the availability yes, sir. of firms in that particular category? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So it's not a blanket MWBE goal, but it's where the, the disparity exists. That is correct. Yes, sir. So, as, as again, once we have three or more, again, three is the minimal threshold. Once we have that three or more, you can set a goal for that particular category. Uh, Steve can talk about the overall process. If there are other scopes that have three or more as well, that goes into the overall matrix for determining the goal. But we definitely, at a bare minimum, must have three minority businesses or three WBEs in a particular category in order to move forward with that goal. Okay. Just want to say for the record that the room got just a little bit smarter. Um, <laughs> Councilmember Ashmere has joined us. Welcome back, um, uh, Dempo. Councilmember Wallington has joined us, and Councilmember Moreno has joined us. So we're we're a little bit smarter now. Continue. Well, where we are right now, I'd like to say uh, we're ninety percent there. Uh, next steps uh, would include uh, a council committee uh, vote on these staff recommendations, and then if the majority of city uh, uh, council approves, then it will be placed on the city or, or council committee uh, approval, would we'll take it up to the full city council agenda for uh, April 10th for public hearing on the new policy. Uh, and then after that, uh, if the majority approves the adoption of the new CBI policy, then the CBI policy and procedures will become effective on July 1st uh, or the new fiscal year. And even before that, uh, there would be a bunch of training for uh, our internal stakeholders as well as uh, our external stakeholders. Uh, so I would say easily 90% uh, at this point. Any questions? Okay, uh, I will open the floor up for question. Uh, Councilmember Drakes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I won't repeat everything I've said in the past about this. I, I appreciate uh, what you're doing now in the sense of increasing, I guess, the focus on certain beneficiary businesses. Um, and I think that's particularly appropriate because the data we saw concerned me somewhat in that it didn't look like minority owned businesses were actually claiming a big share of the total contracting that was being done pursuant to the program. And given the intent of the program, that seemed to me like we weren't completely on target. So uh, that that's good. It's also good that we are streamlining the policy and the manual distinction and giving ourselves uh, collectively more latitude to uh, make administrative changes uh, without having it become like a, uh, you know, a constitutional question each time. Uh, I guess one uh, question I do have, Mr. Powers, we've gone back and forth a little bit on these legalities and stuff. So uh, as we kind of heighten the focus on a certain group of businesses, um, does the legal situation change at all? Uh, are we still uh, as confident as we were before about our ability to, uh, to respond in case somebody challenges this program? And I know that we did the disparity study through the same lens, as it were, we had the SBEs separated. But could an SBE, for example, say, hey, we're now worse off than we were before, and take that as an opportunity to challenge the program? So 
I'm hearing about three questions, so let me yeah. just take them in order. Um, can any firm actually challenge this actual program? Uh, the answer is yes. I will al allude to the fact um, we were challenged previously with the city of Charlotte, as I understand it, sometime early 2000, 2002 range. We were challenged by a minority business for uh, actually uh, not having an accurate disparity study at that time. Um, so there's nothing that prevents anyone from challenging us. So let me just answer that question. To the second question of defensibility, I, I will reiterate my legal opinion um, that Patrick also has concurred with as well, is that this program is legally defensible. Um, I do believe that right now focusing on what we're allowed by law to do, which is again promote M's and W's, uh, to the extent that they are available, I think is legally cons consistent. However, you're also alluding to another issue, which I am keeping track of, uh, which is the uh, the fair cases, which is one against UNC and one against Harvard, uh, which is, I think, now pending before uh, the U.S. Supreme Court. Those cases, while not dealing with contracting, are actually dealing with the issue of race in uh, college admissions. Uh, depending on how the uh, U.S. Supreme Court were to rule in those cases, could have a dramatic impact on the use of race in contracting as well. Um, but at this time, there has not been a, a judicial case that has come out uh, or any other uh, information that's given me the opinion that we are not operating legally in regards to our program as of today. Again, I, I will say that I reserve the right, uh, as well as Patrick, that if something were to change, we would brief counsel immediately. But as of today, I think I will reiterate the previous opinion. We're, we're legally sound. So if I may, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm on board with the goals of the program, so you know this is not a, a hostile statement. I just have a, le a level of a technical discomfort with the spirit of the law and how we're accomplishing these things. So I'll just say that. And the other point I've made before is uh, there is a cost associated with contracting this way as opposed to unrestricted lowest bidder contracting. And I would be more comfortable if I thought we had a handle on how much we invest as a, toward these goals and what the measurable benefits are. Can we identify how the minority business community is profiting from this and, and, and what we're paying in contracting, because the numbers are large, there are hundreds of millions, right, that are subject to this kind of scrutiny. And uh, I just think it would make sense, like any other priority that we have, for us to be, have an awareness of this is what it could have cost, this is what we did pay instead, uh, and here are the advantages, the benefits that we're deriving from it. So on that basis, I don't know if I can vote for it, but I'm fully confident that it will have all the votes it needs. Well, to that last point, Mr. Driggs, uh, and I know you brought it up before, uh, we have a solicitation uh, for a quote right now for economic impact study uh, to address that question as well as others, because quite frankly, it's going to help us understand uh, on a number of levels our ROI uh, on this program. Uh, we've put this out on the street. We're probably going to take the uh, deadline. Uh, for those quotes to come back is some point next week. At that point, we'll select uh, a firm to do this study. I understand it'll take about four months. We might be able to bring it in with our annual report, uh, but that has been at top of mind, and we're, we're currently addressing it. I appreciate that. Look forward to the results. And I think that will also help you to target uh, better, right, mm -hmm. uh, how, how we implement this program. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Wellington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a number of questions. I'm sure that the answers are somewhere in this administrative manual. Um, so my questions are in the spirit of connecting the dots for the broader conversation, right? Um, so the first one, just in follow-up to some of the previous conversations we've had as it relates to bonding and how that has been a historical barrier to uh, participation, can you speak to the status of um, of our work and our assistance in helping MBEs and uh, WBEs well, uh, I'll answer that uh, really broadly, and then I come to you in probably two weeks to go into the details of where we are uh, as in the way of an update. Uh, but we're in a good place right now. Uh, we are working with the selected uh, contractor, I'll call them, 
in terms of outlining all the elements of that, the milestones, how the payments will be made, uh, and then how we will uh, develop the program for release sometime after the new fiscal year. Uh, but we're in a really good place with it. Uh, we are uh, working on our budget to make sure that we have a, uh, a year two, so we have the funding for year one. Uh, and it, it's really going to be a, a tremendous program, I believe. Uh, it's going to be race and gender neutral, so we lead uh, as an SBE program. Uh, uh, so all of those firms who are SBEs will be eligible uh, to participate. Uh, and, and the ideal scene is, number one, uh, for firms to uh, receive new bonding. Uh, those who have uh, bonding already increase bonding and, and, of course, be able to grow all of their capacity uh, to participate on some of the larger uh, projects. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, to that point, can you talk a little bit more about what we're doing to open up some of those bigger cost opportunities, like in the way of CMARS and design build type uh, items? I know that we're that you mentioned here in the overview that our goal is to grow our MBEs and our SBEs and our WBEs uh, from sub opportunities to prime opportunities. So can you just talk a little bit about what what else that looks like or what else we're doing to help folks grow through to some of those larger uh, project goals? Okay. Uh, a lot of what you hear is really construction because our largest amount of spend is with uh, construction firms. However, we're focusing on our uh, other areas of contracting, uh, including our services. Uh, last fall, uh, the manager directed us to create a policy amendment with, that would allow us to focus on 10 to $100,000 range. Mm -hmm. uh, over time, and it'll take some time, uh, we'll see some impact there. In addition, right now we have almost uh, 1,500 firms. We're like 1,490. Uh, mm -hmm. We're looking to increase that amount. Uh, the more firms we have, the more uh, ca capacity type firms we have, uh, the better opportunity we have to contract with them in terms of setting goals and even having prime contracting opportunities. Anything you would want to add to any of that? I, I would just probably just chime in from, I think, to your core question. Um, and, and <laughs> Renee, you may need to jump in on this one as well. If we're using CMARS design build, they're going to be probably much larger contracts. Mm -hmm. you're, you're talking not even $10 million. It's probably at the low end. You're talking very high. Mm -hmm. I know in the case of Charlotte Water, uh, as counsel for Charlotte Water, we're using uh, design bill for, you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar contracts. At, at, just at, at a starting point for CMARS, the airport is typically using those. Again, they're not for a small dollar amount where we're using um, smaller dollar amounts, uh, typically based on, I, I would say, kind of some practice and procedure has been design bid bill, which is more or less what you know is hard bid. Those have been for those contracts, you know, maybe half a million dollars to maybe 10, maybe $15 million on average. Um, and, and that was like, that's because staff has the expertise to be able to do all the necessary, you know, design work, information, and kind of just bid it out and see what the private market is telling us. Whereas the CMARS and the design build formats, we have a problem. We have a pot of money, but we may not necessarily have a solution, mm -hmm. and we're asking you to kind of figure it out for us with, within the bounds. So I, I think, as, as Stephen has alluded to, in order to get to that point of having those businesses compete, you got to get them to the point where they're getting bonded beyond uh, the half a million dollar mark consistently. So when it, we're moving them up the food chain from half a million to a million to 10 million, to the point where they can actually start jumping out there to larger pro uh, projects to create more of a competitive market. So I'm going to pause here and, and turn to Renee if I'm saying anything wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So. Thank you for that. I've got just a couple more. A couple more. <laughs> just a couple <laughs> more. <laughs> um, I would like to uh, understand. I, I want to circle back. I heard you say the ROI, and I'm glad that we're framing the conversation in that way because at the end of the day, this is about how are we increasing business and how capacity and jobs in the community. Um, can you talk about where our impact analysis, our economic impact analysis is, what the status of that is, and will we be receiving that on an annual basis, or what does that work look like? Well, when I learned about the ideal of 
you know, doing this kind of study. It was at a conference, and we thought, wow, that would be, you know, great if we could get that kind of information. Uh, Council Member Driggs asked his question, and it, <laughs> you know, made us realize this is, you know, something that's needed here and now. Uh, and, and so, talk to leadership. Leadership said, uh, we have, you know, uh, a bucket of money that we could uh, perhaps pay for this study, find out more details, which we did. Uh, we've talked about the idea of this being something annual, and if we don't have the funding, we certainly wouldn't do this one time, and then it, that we'd live off of this information. It would be either one or two years, or you know, however uh, our budget allows us to support that kind of information. But uh, the experts that I've talked to, uh, they are. This is what they do. Mm -hmm. uh, they give you the direct impact, the indirect. Uh, induced number, and, and so all of this is something you're going to see, uh, and uh, either it's going to answer your questions, or it's going to uh, we're going to have more questions. At which point, then we know the next step when we do this again, we got to add that into our scope of work what we're looking for. Absolutely, because I think. To the, there's the internal metrics as it relates to how you said about 1,500 businesses have signed up uh, in this program as a result of the city manager's memo. Am I understanding that correctly? That's so right. Very interested in those metrics and how the utilization of that. Where is that program at currently? I know it's been a number of months and there's been a lot of training. I'd love to see the utilization and then as an out uh, put our outcome metric exactly what you said. What is our what is our economic impact? So I'm definitely looking forward to see that information. Um, and then finally, finally, <laughs> <laughs> finally, I don't expect anything less. <laughs> and there's a lot here. There's a lot here. Um, exciting times. Um, when we think about the, this program, we know that a ton of work has been done on it over the years, um, and in a lot of ways this is benchmark across our state, right? We talk about Charlotte as a region. What are we doing to regionalize this program? I know that there are other municipalities, other counties that are very interested in leveraging this program and are willing to pay in to do so. Uh, what are we doing to, to help that along its way? Does that make sense? So the reason I was leaning over to, to tell Steve I will handle this is unfortunately I have to be the big and bad in this instance. Always. <laughs> um, legally, it would not be beneficial for us to leverage it, only because, as I've said before, disparity studies are a basis for that entity to be able to go in and remedy the actual gap between those minority businesses and women-owned businesses. Um, I would use a hypothetical example. Again, I cannot confirm this. If CMS wanted to jump in with us and try to partner in that regard, Steve can work with them on services, the CPCC aspect. He could possibly work on some of the companies that they're doing you know, with CMS if they're also in our group for a bonding program. But we could not actually partner with CMS on creating goals and other opportunities in that regard unless they were part of our disparity study. Most disparity study consultants will tell you they do not like to do two entities at once only because there's too much chaos. Um, I think when we did a disparity study, if I remember correctly, maybe sometime an update around like 2007, 2008, we tried to do a joint one uh, with us, the county and the school system, and it definitely went hay haywire where everybody was like, thank you so much and went their separate ways. So. I, I would just say from a legal standpoint, if we're trying to remedy disparity, it's only going to be us. However, I think Steve has other mechanisms, which are services that are race neutral, gender neutral, that we can partner with other agencies and entities to address those aspects. It may be training, it may be actually other development, we can do that, but goal setting is going to be only for us. Sure. So I'm glad you made the distinction. I'm not necessarily talking about the goals. I'm talking about the infrastructure piece. And, yeah, that's 100% him there. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and that's something that, uh, and we've talked about it, we will entertain. But we have to, let's take the bonding program. We have to get through year one, understand uh, all the finer components of it, and uh, we're knocking on wood. We believe it's going to be a successful program. Naturally, it's the first of its kind in the state. And so I've gotten at least five uh, phone calls and or emails, you know, saying I want in. 
And so we'll cross that bridge, I, I think, to mitigate the expense, it makes sense. However, you know, the first person I go to is him and say, can we do this? Awesome, thank you. Thank okay. you. Councilmember Moreno? You good? Yep. Councilmember Ajmer, do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And some of my questions were addressed by uh, Ms. Watlington's. Uh, it looks like she read my mind, so thank you. <laughs> thank you. She, she addressed some of my questions too, so, yeah. uh, so I, I think we're all good. So, um, Mayor Pro Tem, any? I, I just want to um, give CBI um, props. They've been very thorough. Um, council was pretty adamant and um, made a lot of requests a couple months ago. Um, they have a small staff, but they've been very um, on it as it relates to reaching out to council members, um, keeping updates, and obviously doing a lot of work. So just want to kind of put that up. Councilmember Mayfield, any parting shots? No, we're good. I'm in the decoration. Your decoration. <laughs> well, I, I, I too want to echo the mayor pro tem. Since we received the disparity study in December, uh, you made a commitment that you were going to work extremely hard and fast. Uh, to uh, take out all the policy questions from the disparity study and present it back to council in a way that um, we can understand it and digest it in a short period of time. And I think we talked about that time frame. I, I, I didn't think you could make it, but, you're, <laughs> but, but you, you're, you're doing really good work as the mayor pro tem said with um, limited capacity for now. I understand you're interviewing, you're out on the field, uh, trying to, to staff your office. And, and so I'm really, Please about the direction in which things are going. Um, members, you, you see the next step on the on the screen, which is to have a council committee vote on the staff recommendations today. Uh, and if we get a majority, uh, then it will be placed on the council's agenda for April 10th, which is next Monday, for a public hearing on the the new CBI policy. So, do I have a uh, a um, motion to accept the staff recommendations to? Um, um, for this to be placed on the council's agenda for April 10th for a public hearing. So moved. Second. Probably moved and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Nothing personal. No. <laughs> uh, uh, council member Ashmer. Yes. Yes, we got three here, so we're, we're all good. Um, so. Yes. Yes. So, um, Steve, um, keep your your foot on the gas and 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 continue to move this thing forward for us. We really appreciate you. Really appreciate your advice as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is the Aviation Museum support, and I turn it over to Ms. Dotson. Thank you, Councilmember Graham. Um, we felt like this was a good time to bring you an update. Talk about where we are going, a little bit of the history of the museum and where we're going from here, and make a staff recommendation for, to council for um, some financial support of the project. Could you go to the next step? Can we go to the next slide, please? There we go. So as I said, we would look a little bit back at the history and then look ahead at the new opportunities for the museum and why we think this is an important part of um, kind of our ecosystem. Next slide, please. Um, the Carolina Aviation Museum opened in 1992, adjacent to the Charlotte Douglas Airport. Um, and it was dedicated to show, showcasing the history of aviation. And you can see from the image um, the original Carolina's Aviation Museum. And it hosted about 75,000 visitors annually. Next slide. In 2016, um, I think the awareness of the Aviation Museum was elevated when it became the home of the Miracle on the Hudson, piloted by Captain Sully Sullenberger. Um, a lot of people really took notice uh, to what the museum was at that time. Next slide. In 2019, excuse me, the Aviation Museum suspended operations and began planning for a new facility. 
um, a fundraising campaign was launched and to with the goal to raise 31 million to reopen the museum as the Sullenberger Aviation Museum. Part of what led to that was finding a home within the airport that they could call their own. Where they currently had been, um, the hangar was needed for actual aviation um, operations. Next slide. So since 2018, we've had ongoing conversations with the museum in various ways that they support our community. They contribute to the cultural amenity and the engine of what Charlotte Douglas is. We think they can generate more than 120,000 visitors annually. We've also had extensive conversations with them about their presence on the west side and their STEM programs and the ability to make community partnerships and support the surrounding neighborhoods. Um, we feel like the Aviation Museum presence at the airport is really important in keeping and strengthening a pipeline for future jobs around STEM as well as aviation aerospace um, in the STEM innovation again. And so having them in a home where we can really start to emphasize that and make connect connections into our quarters of opportunity with West Boulevard, Wilkinson, and other parts of, um, of the city, especially on the west side, is something that is important while continuing to have that exposure on growing the aviation and aerospace industry within Charlotte. Next slide. This is a couple of slides of what the new aviation museum will look like. Next slide. And the fundraising efforts. Um, to date, 29 million has been raised, so we would be the last 2 million in. Notable contributions have been from the state at 10 million, the airport's Cannon Fund, 5 million, Mecklenburg County, 3 million, Honeywell, a million and a half. And then other private donors, such as Bank of America, the Dowd family, and Rick Elias at a million dollars each. Um, this, again, the city's proposal is for two million from the hospitality fund, which allows them to reach their fundraising goals. Next slide. And <clears throat> we would request a council action for this if it gets through the committee today in the discussion today for April 10th in order to keep them on their construction schedule, which would have the Aviation Museum opening in late 2023. This also allows us to continue the path of these discussions around um, some community uh, training and workforce development and STEM opportunities within our quarters of opportunity. So with that, I will stop for any comments, discussions. Thank you, Ms. Dotson. The floor is open for Questions and comments, uh, Council Member Drakes. Uh, which bucket does it come from, hospitality? T1 and T2 in the tourism. Right. I, I, I would just say to me this is easy. Uh, I think the ability to identify Charlotte with the inspiration of that miracle <clears throat> is a great opportunity for us. Pleased to see Mr. Elias among the donors since he was standing on the wing of the plane mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that memorable picture over at Red Ventures. Uh, so uh, I ju I'll just say I'm in support. I'm prepared to make a motion. Okay. Do we need a motion for this? Uh, at the appropriate time, we do. All right. Council Member Wallington for a series of questions. <laughs> I might let you go and then wait. You the most money this time. I only have one. <laughs> The floor is yours. <laughs> I only have one, and I'm kind of well, only one. You're slipping. Of all times, right? <laughs> I kind of my question, I think, is actually what Mr. Drake asked, but I'm gonna ask it in a more um, layman's way. We have this whole broader conversation about um, uh, tourism dollars and what we're gonna need in the future. Can you just provide a little color? And I will say this as a precursor: yes, as a District Three rep and a former uh, Aviation Academy graduate, I definitely want to support this. I just want to make sure that for the broader public we kind of understand uh, how this falls into that larger conversation just real briefly so quickly you know that we essentially have four funds um, within our hospitality we have our convention center bucket um, what we call our tourism one tourism two that is kind of are lumped together and then our NASCAR um, funding bucket and NASCAR Hall of Fame excuse me and so these are very fluid. The availability of funds is, is very fluid in those. And so if you remember last year, for example, we had the conversation about the Hornets and Spectrum Arena. 
um, and that was coming out of the tourism buckets as well. Um, and we thought that would leave us a little bit constrained. While finance does a, and budget does a great job every year of like not completely draining us dry, but that left some availability of funds. We performed better over the past year than we anticipated, which created this, um, this new availability within that fund. And so that's where these would, these would come from. Again, it doesn't take everything out of it, but because um, the projections were better than expected, um, or the revenues were better than expected. We have this. We have this availability, and that came in simultaneously. I think with the ask for the additional for the additional funds. Thanks. I'm finished. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just. I'm just I'm but I'll reserve my time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I thought you would. <laughs> Councilman Milano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say I'm actually. Um, I'm actually pretty pleased with the list of um, participants in, in donations for this. I mean, the state of North Carolina with $10 million, that says a lot. It says a lot to, you know, what this will mean for our region, for our state in general, you know, for the state to come in. I think that says, um, that kind of puts an exclamation mark on this to say that our state intends to, you know, market this, <laughs> this possibility as well. So um, our counterparts on, you know, the county commission have already committed. And this is a no-brainer for me. I'm, I'm prepared and ready to support it. Cool. Right. Council Member Ajmer, any questions? No. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm prepared to receive a motion. Move to so approve. Second. Uh, it's been proven that properly second um, to uh, forward to the city council an appropriation of $2 million for the Suttenberger Aviation Museum. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? So move. Right. And we actually might have a short meeting. We might. Well, I, I, I might make it just a little Never bit longer say, right here. Yeah, say right exactly. So because I know we have some folks from Eastland, um, uh, Eastside here at the meeting, can you give us a brief overview based on where we stand with Eastland Yard? So yes. that trip won't be in vain. Um, yes. So thank you, Council Member Graham. Um, very quickly, following last month's discussion, I um, want to make it really clear to, to everybody on the east side that we continue to vet the proposals that we have, reissue um, questions that have come up either from the council discussions or questions that we had as we went through the proposals. Those um, should be going back out today uh, to the proposers. I know that there have been other discussions based on, it, uh, amongst the proposers based on uh, last month's discussion as well. Um, that might lead to different types of proposals or adjustments to the proposals. And so we will continue. Again, um, we've had new people that have reached out about ideas and concepts, um, and we continue to just be open to that. But again, staying in what we said last month, which is the, um, the intent stays the same, right, for what we want to do. And again, continuing to vet um, the proposals that we have. Okay. Um, really quickly. Yes. If I may. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, um, because I got a, a question today, and I want to make sure that we address it. Um, what is our official RFP window for our 60 days? Are we at liberty to say that in a way that would, you know, kind of address that part? So I think the way that we are working is that we would anticipate, from a staff perspective, we wanted to be able to come back in the meeting in May okay. and have a, an update discussion. And, you know, if we have a recommendation on a, a path forward, but that 60-day, in my mind, window was for the May ED committee meeting. Okay. And so we'll bring that back next month and give really a status update, and then I think it can be up to the commission. If there's still more questions, we may keep it going. Um, if we pick a path and want to have a path to move move with, then we can, we can do that. Okay. And then um, an additional question with that being said, um, are we creating parameters for the proposals? Like, is that something that we're going to do as a body, or is that something that you guys are going to do as a department? Can you elaborate when you say parameters? Meaning, like, I mean? that's the kind of questions that I'm getting from Eastsiders. So basically is, are you telling people what you're looking for in the request for proposal? So, but, uh, let, me, let me pause. There's not 
a request for a proposal, right? It's not a formal RFP. It's not a formal RFP. We extended the period during which people could submit to us. Okay. Yes. So, so what we did and what we can make available, and we will make sure that all of you have it, is that when we received the first proposal um, back in late December, mm -hmm. we then posted um, in the um, in the paper what we needed to see. Okay. And I think that it's important to stay consistent with, with that what and, that was and with what that was and okay. so we can we can send that around so that everybody has it in case you get any any questions okay. um but the, that was in my mind those are the parameters okay um i think the one thing that we have not done is you know based on last month's discussion um <clears throat> come back and say here is the set amount that we would invest i think we were really trying to work through the proposals to see if we could get the proposal that was that was right rather than from a staff perspective setting a right. specific dollar amount. Okay. Okay. We good? Okay. Last agenda item um, is boards and commissions review package. And this is a topic that all the committees took up um, a month ago. We didn't because we had a, a long meeting last, last month. So we're just getting around to it. Very, very important. And I'll turn it over to Ms. Dotson to elaborate. Right. Um, so as council member Graham said, this was a referral and the, the review boards and commissions was to assess and make any recommendations specific to each of the boards and commissions and the continued purpose moving forward or restructuring or disabandonment. Um, based on the reviewing and the annual report survey results provided for current boards and commissions, um, are there any committees that or any of the committee that feel warrant further discussion as to the current role of the board, the alignment of city services, or consideration of changes. And so that's really what we're what we're here to discuss today. Okay, it's just my comment, and I, I just want to acknowledge again the Business Advisory Council. They have been very uh, assertive in terms of trying to get before this committee, even before we decided to have this type of discussion about boards and commissions. So. I, I, I want to flag them as a, an organization that we want to begin to have a conversation with, um, maybe get a, a presentation from them to us uh, and find out ways we can align ourselves with them. I think that's one is we should do. The, the other group that has called me consistently has been the International Cabinet. Uh, and I think at some point they were maybe in, in neighborhood development, I think at some point, which Housing which is kind of weird, right? But, yeah. um, but, but I think we're going to absorb them um, to what we're doing. And again, want to, and they did come to a meeting what, a couple of months ago, yep. uh, ED committee meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, so I just want to acknowledge their uh, assertiveness in terms of really wanting to connect with this um, this committee in a very meaningful way. Uh, and uh, I think we ought to make that happen sooner than later as well. And so. Uh, all the other committees are important. Uh, I think Council Member Wallington at the last um, committee meeting summary had an outline that made sense for, for all the committees, so I don't want to reproduce um, the wheel, I think, but she said, um, do you wish to comment on those? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it made a lot of sense, and so I just opened the floor for any discussion um, in reference to that, um, and so. Oh no, I really don't have too much, <laughs> too much to add. Get something up, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you outlined it well. I think overall we can each take a look and see, as far as the boards under our purview from a uh, operation standpoint, what makes sense, what's working, what's um, what could be improved, and where we could go from there. So. Okay. And, and I really would love to scrub it. We don't have to do it here, but offline with staff, that so maybe at least you know once a month, every other month, right? There's a advisory group that under our domain kind of gives us a status update, right? Or, or an annual report or some type of communication. Uh, and then, and I'm just thinking out loud, right? It, it would be nice if, if we had a, uh, a special meeting where we invite all our collaborative partners with us, where we just, have a reception or some type of networking event 
where all our partners who have an affiliation with economic development, we get together and, and have some informal conversations, informal discussions, that way we can kind of knock everybody out at the same time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> but also we can pick yeah. up where we need to be focusing on based on those conversations. So I just throw that out there as, a, um, as an idea and that we can develop um, later and maybe staff can bring us something back that we can do something maybe this summer to, towards that end. Mr. Chair, uh, uh, yes. So I, I just wanted to share that uh, the Transportation Planning and Development Committee reviewed the, the uh, boards and commissions associated with us and discovered that a number of them had been created in partnership with the county mm -hmm. or had some sort of statutory role. So there wasn't a whole lot of scope to mm -hmm. consider. Uh, I think our takeaway, and then there was one at least that was changed uh, automatically by virtue of the implementation of the UDO. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think our takeaway was the same thing, which is that we need to offer greater visibility and engagement with us on the part of the people who volunteer. Uh, I, I didn't like the idea in general of abolishing these to the extent that there were people who belonged to them and enjoyed that opportunity to participate in the dealings with the city. So if we kind of tackle this issue of making ourselves a little more available, I think that's the best outcome. I did have a question about the PCAC. So apparently on the website, it says disbanded on it. Has that decision actually been made? I would have to um, check on that one for you. Okay. Uh, I mean, obviously we were headed in that direction, and I wondered whether the, the, the change to the website maybe was slightly ahead of us. So I'll thanks. That for you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I think it's important if you look on um, your presentation packet on slides four and slides five of you know, what are the advisory boards? And then slide five really shows you how, which one falls into city versus city, city county versus other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we've done it in one hour exactly. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what, you're sorry. Uh, you're Kelly, no, no. <laughs> Our city clerk, Ms. Kelly, is on the line. She can actually answer Council Member Drew's question. So oh, okay. yeah, let's, get, let's hear it. Ms. Kelly? Where is she? I don't see. I we can't she, hear. I thought she was on. Okay, maybe right. not. So now, we now. Swear, we're still at the hour. Okay. okay. Me, me, uh, adjourn the meeting? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Meeting adjourned. Oh, in favor. All right. Absolutely. Yeah.